Welcome to Canada. Welcome to round number two of the iRacing Road Pro Series here on Racebot TV and on iRacing Live. Qualifying is underway. We're going to get you to that one in just one moment's time. There is a look at your track conditions here today. 23 degrees Celsius, 50% relative humidity, wind speed of four kilometers an hour. And in the booth for qualifying, it is... Jonathan Simon and Jake Sperry. Over to you, Johnny. Thanks, Will. Very excited to get back into things for round number two around the Circuit Jew. Brother Nov, very hot track temps, Jake, for qualifying this afternoon. It's 35 degrees out there in the track temps. And at this circuit for Montreal, it really takes its tolls on the brake temperatures as well as those rear tires. Well, it certainly can be considered hot in some respects, but I call this more a more atypical, ideal day that I think a lot of drivers are looking at. And I was looking at the times that were done in the Racing Grand Prix Series race just one night ago. And already they're eclipsing those times by three, four tenths of a second. Sebastian Job, currently the pole man on a 113.3. The second lap's starting to come in. Michael Partington in the seven currently. Position number four out on circuit. Needs to find two tenths to get past Riley Preston, his own teammate. Crosses the line, setting up for this big banker lap. Yep, definitely. So Sebastian Job, one minute, 13.396 ahead of Josh Rogers and Riley Preston. The two Australians. Currently in second and third, Michael Partington fourth, Ricardo Orozco in the fifth position. Now this is our top split for qualifying, so it's split in two at the moment. And what we'll see right now is a couple of surprises possibly. So 15 minute session, three maximum laps. What about Michael Dinkle who heads through the final corner? Will he be able to climb up from the seventh position? He was battling away for those final podium positions last time out. Up into P2 is Michael Dinkle. Jake, what a lap time from him. But he's still about two tenths off from Sebastian Job. Two tenths off. So that's two tenths that he's got to work on. Big wiggle out to the exit for Sergi Lorenz in the number eight machine as he makes his charge to the line. 14.784 won't improve on that time. So he'll be very uh, frustrated by that in many respects. Freddie Rasmussen, though, hasn't set a lap time as of yet. So we'll see if he sets a lap time for the second lap. No, he's got one chance and one chance only in the course in racing machine. Yep, he was our pole sitter last time out. Can he do it again in round number two here at Montreal? He comes through, turns number three and four, using the curve. Very easy to touch the ball here on the outside. Rasmussen a bit cautious there on the exit. Through turn number six, widening the line, using the curb to ease the car into the corner, just to pull you in. It's like a railroad. And now on towards this back straight, bit of breathing space. And you break just as you hit under the bridge. Through the very tight eight and nine up against the wall once again roll bar doing all the work there through those two corners and this is a very easy corner to lock up multiple lines through here rasmussen just misses the apex slightly small twitch on the exit struggling for traction here jake but he'll enter that drs zone flick it on and try to maintain as much speed here through the final chicane Yes, and he needs all the pace he can and a little bit more. This final chicane catches so many people out. Quebec wall, the wall of champions on the right-hand side, misses it by a good foot or so as he makes the charge to the line. 13-3, the time to beat is 13-4. It's second, but again, it's course sim racing one and two as things stand. Josh Rogers now through the final chicane. Yep, let's have a look at Rogers. Whoa, really flying over the curbs. Bouncing would be an understatement. Is it a quick lap time, though, for Josh Rogers? Doesn't no. improve. 13.577. Almost matches his first lap times. What about David Williams in that Coanda Simsport car? Currently in the eighth position. He's going to start on the first four rows. I think David Williams is backed off here, so this is an outlap, Jake. Williams is not the strongest qualifier in the world, but he's definitely quick when it comes to the race. 
David Williams, we saw him what happened last night and he was a driver who was definitely applying the pressure to the likes of the Michael Partingtons here. So probably in a good position right now as he makes his charge on his final attempt to set a lap time into one, into two. Light on the power as he looks to get himself going out again. Alex Simpson as well needs to improve his lap time right now. So we'll keep an eye out on what sort of times he's been doing as he looks to make his final drive the line currently in position 12 which is not akin to where he should be moves up position number six that's okay not brilliant but okay at least he's still dancing in this one but david williams wants to improve from what is currently position number nine in qualifying yep so williams here oh wow williams what a save there through turn number eight and nine definitely lose a bit of lap time there through this tight hairpin lapongle Oh, he's slow and steady. Wins the race, I think. Through that hairpin. Out in the way. There's plenty of time remaining, so he will cross the line before the checkered flag. Now, remember, qualifying rules, as we said. 15-minute session. Three maximum laps. So this will be Williams' final chance at improving. Oh, he ran very deep through the final chicane. Almost collected the wall of champions. Here he is across the line. David Williams. Does Not he improve? Quicker. Nope. Not quick enough, so he remains in P number nine. Now, the first row is almost exactly the same, Jake. It's a core sim racing front row at the moment, and it was the other way around in Interlagos. Michael Dinkle is in third, but Alex Simpson, who was on that second row at Interlagos, will only start no greater than six at the moment, as we still have a few drivers out there, and Eric Andre and Dan Brewer to finish their qualifying sessions. Yes, so two more drivers to set lap times here, and well... What we can say at this stage is there are a few surprises that we have right now. For example, Yuho Abe in the 10 machine up into 7th position in qualifying. The first we've seen of him this season. A very good job from Yuho Abe to get the job done in a way that really does surprise a lot of people. But Dan Brewer right now struggled in that opening race of the season, making that transition as we know, and joining Evolution Racing Team, which arguably has signed every man and his neighbour this season, including adding Boris Spolstra to their list for this race. Yep, ERT have made some moves in the driver market. Dan Brewer, though, is here to set his first qualifying lap time for round number two. He's currently in P28. Aurelian Talmon behind. It doesn't look like he's going to go out and qualifying. He's currently registered, but Dan Brewer backs off. He'll begin a lap, and you'll hopefully improve at least one position minimum. He was very strong last round out at Interlagos, so it wasn't the cleanest race for him. He's a driver I enjoyed racing against for a couple of years. And Eric Andre, though, behind. He comes through the final chicane. Jake, what can he do? He's currently in P23. Well, he's on an out lap, so he'll have one more chance to go after this. He came out to the pitch just behind the driver of Dan Brewer. Into one, into two. The real championship racing machine. French sim racing and the bright future that it holds with an Eric Andre as well. Currently in 23rd out on circuit. We'll have this lap and probably this lap only to try and make something happen. Brewer as well on the run to eight and nine. And Brewer looking very, very tentative through that section. Gets the power down. But the big difference is it's seven tenths of a second splitting the top 18. He's got to do at least a 14 flat to have any chance. Yep, exactly. You saw the twitch there on the exit and then through the bumpy braking zone of turn number 10. Now, the very long straight here, the casino straight. It's an eternity. It's a good chance for the drivers to take a break once again because this circuit, you are active on steering, active on that left foot under braking, finds the brake marker into the final chicane. Oh, spot on is Dan Brewer. Isn't a quick lap time though on paper. Here he comes across the line. 41. He improves to P19. So a 14-1, not good enough, Jake. It wasn't a 14 flat. It wasn't a 14 flat. And Andre all over the anti-cut curves as he heads through the final section there. Really aggressive from Andre, trying everything to get lap time. And it's a 14-8 lap time. He doesn't improve P24. And you'd have to feel he'll be very disappointed as everybody has now set laps. Yep. So, Jake, final thing before we look at the results. Course sim racing front row again, but... Uh, it's the other way around this time. Sebastian Job, the race winner from round number one, proving his worth here. Certainly is. And Sebastian Job, it's almost as if there's a sticker dynamite under his seat because he found a lap 
He found two laps that were good enough for pole position. His 13.9 was uh, 113.39 was good enough. So he does a 113.3 flat. Fantastic work from Job. But as we know here with Canada, this race is not all about who's on the front row because there is so much opportunity for things to go awry. Yep, exactly true. So we'll have a look at the results for qualifying this afternoon. Sebastian Job on pole position alongside his course sim racing teammate, Frederick Rasmussen. Again, a course sim racing front row lockout. It's the opposite this time around. It was Rasmussen in round number one, Job this time in round number two. Michael Dinkle, though, will join them on the second row alongside Josh Rogers. Behind them on the third row, it's Riley Preston and Alex Simpson. Yuha Weibe and Michael Partington in seventh and eighth. And then rounding out the top 10, you have Coanda Simpsports, David Williams, and a veteran, Diogo Oliveira, now part of ERT for 2018 and ongoing. He rounds out the top 10, exact same lap time as Ricardo Orozco in P11, just ahead of former Apex Racing UK driver, Martin Van Lusenwood. He's another ERT driver who's joined the field. Same with Boris Spolster there, sharing that seventh throw with Tommy Oscar in the PSR car. Jorge Montañez in 15th alongside Massimiliano Ficara, two world championship veterans, and Moritz Lochner. Expected a bit of a better qualifying for him. He's in the core motorsports car, so they're a bit different this weekend. Core sim racing will be in the orange. Core motorsports in that purple and yellow. He's joined with Zoran Jonjic, Dan Brewer, Alex Sadler behind the very young Alex Sadler, part of Radicals Online. Bobby Zelensky, we know how quick he is on ovals. He's trying his worth here. I think I motivated him a bit for uh to, i think i motivated him to hit the roadside for a little bit and then rounding out our qualifying standings is giuseppe raguzza calestani and eric andre sergey lorenz carlo labati is van below nicholas rasmussen no relation to freddie and aurelian talamon who did not set a lap time in p29 so we'll leave you to it for now. Join us for post-qualifying coverage and pre-race coverage for round number two of the iRacing Road Pro Series. Don't leave us. We'll see you after the ad break. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Montreal. It's been another interesting qualifying. And get this, 
your top five drivers separated, in fact, your top six drivers separated in this qualifying session by less than three tenths of a second. Of course, what also happens at this stage here, Johnny, is we combine the qualifying times together. Two splits going on here today. We had a total of 57 drivers try to make their way into the field, but not everyone punches a ticket into the race. No, they don't. It's unfortunate for those who miss out and um, albeit we know that it's a course sim racing front row still after merging the sessions together. A lot of the quick drivers will be in that session we covered, but there are a few in that second split that are able to make their way through. Now, Jake, what I want to note about here for, for qualifying this afternoon is first things first, can anybody stop core sim racing? Because those two guys of Job and Rasmussen are not only very quick, but Come next year in the World Championship, if they do indeed get that license and finish in the top 10, they could be challenging for race wins if they can start beating Martin Kronke. Uh, I think it's possible. Uh, I think it's possible because Sebastian Job has taken a year out. He's looked to try and find himself. And we saw how well he did inside the Apex Racing UK machines. He was challenging for podiums in the Gregor Hutu era. He was that driver which everyone noticed and thought, this guy is going to be a future world champion. He fell off the rails a little bit. He's come back. He's got new focus, new team. And he's taking Frederick Rasmussen with him, a driver who I think is the master of all trades. He's the king of GT3. And Frederick Rasmussen is translating very well into this Formula 1 machine. And given time, Rasmussen could easily make that challenge as well. Core look very strong. And I think that it comes down to the work that's done by Isaac Price, the likes of Charles Jurgis back behind the scenes. And I think they've got a really good core initiative that makes sure that they put themselves towards the front. Oh, look at that little one there. A little bit of a core initiative. Um, but it's worth noting that, of course, we have got Freddie Rasmussen, of course, who is so dominant in terms of the Blanc Pine GT series. We've got Sebastian Drove. And actually, what will be very interesting to see is how that team dynamic will work, Jake, over the course of 2018. Because what we have seen is sometimes teams spread themselves very wide. But it's a bit like Marmite, I'm going to say. You know, the more you spread it, the less it spreads overall. You've got to make it all work. And the one worry I have is what will course in racing be able to achieve if they've got two big teams trying to go for victory? Because we've seen it before, Radicals. We've seen it before with Apex. We've even seen it with Coanism Sports and Team Redline and NX Racing right at the very top. You, you have, and that's going to be a very interesting dynamic that has to be looked at, I think, for core sim racing because they've already got Isaac Price there, they've already got Chen Bollet Bassi and Pashalis Jurgis who they all already have very much secure in that three-man team. You put Joven Rasmussen in to make that five, that's a very interesting situation but I think they've got enough depth within their GT3 team to not necessarily have to rely on these drivers day in and day out and I think that likes Joven Rasmussen definitely can make a name for themselves when it comes to this championship and when it comes to the world championship in 2018 if they so qualify yeah it's also worth noting um the fact that your top 10 in qualifying was all from the session that we were showing so johnny the top level the top i rated guys are the ones hitting the biggest lap times the fastest time in qualifying was a 113.305 slowest time in qualifying well a 118.9 that was the second and a half slower than anyone else in fact you take the two slowest drivers away you're still looking at about a three and a half second difference and it shows some guys have got quite a bit of work to do it does, and it's a shorter racetrack too. So if you go to somewhere like Spa, that will actually exponentially grow even worse. So uh, to be one tenth off at Montreal is actually a lot bigger than you might think. So uh, that gap from first place to six, I know it's three tenths of a second, but it's a very short racetrack. There are a couple of long straights here. I mean, the keys here is you find a lot of aggressive drivers are really quick at Montreal. Those drivers that love... Uh, and, and this is a very weird way to explain the car, but drivers who like a loose front end, it doesn't make sense when I say that, but just when you turn into a corner, it looks like you're just losing the front end. And um, it, it's where the roll bar really does a lot of work. I think drivers who love to use the curbs are really strong here. But most importantly, those drivers who are strong on the brakes, so anybody who's confident with that left foot, that's where they're, they're really quick here. It really is a driver's circuit. And it's why you see these lap times so 
far away from each other in terms of um, from first to last place because um, it is a driver's track. There's more margin for error. There's walls around the place. You can't just run off and rejoin. So uh, you definitely don't want to be butchering your lap. Yeah, this is as close as we really get to a, what I like to call a street scene here um, at Montreal. It is very demanding. And of course, we go back in history. You think about the minutia of, you know, between the track and having a huge off. Go back to Kazuki Machine, when the most famous moment, of course. I would argue at this track in World Championship Grand Prix Series history. One thing I want to talk about, whilst we've got a couple of moments here, this is to both of you. I'll come to you first, Johnny. Is it does look that we are kind of running in a kind of free team game to make competition for 2018 in the World Championship Grand Prix Series. And I'm going to say this with respect to the free teams that we've got, the big free teams, um, Corsin Racing, Apex Racing UK, Evolution Racing Team. I say this about any disrespect to TTL Esports, who's got joshua rogers in p4 because they are a bit of an outlier right now but what i would say is it does seem to be that we're in a situation that a lot of people is putting a lot of time to just try and find a way of getting maybe one maybe two maybe three of their guys in knowing how tough the competition is going to be yeah well i mean ert for example like i don't really think most of their team will make it there are some that will but um you know they're under the pump too and to me, it's it's very important that Core get Job and Rasmussen through. That will make a huge difference to, to their build for next year. And this was a team that really hardly even existed until they got Isaac Price. And they're like, oh, we've got a chance at F1 now. And then Jurgis was brought in and then Job was brought in. And you're like, oh, okay, this is a real legitimate team to, to, to shoot for race wins now in 2018. So that's very important. Uh, Dinkle and S uh, Simpson. So... Dinkle and Simpson have done a good, consistent job. I don't think they're too focused on actually winning this series. It's making their way through because Apex have, uh, I just think, um, a, a unit of young drivers out there, Jamie Fluke, Higelin, Marcus Jensen, a whole lot of other names as well I don't want to forget, but just a group that they need this veteran experience from Dinkle and Simpson. They're very important to get through, but um, Williams as well for Coanda will be a bonus. There's only 10 spots. Not everyone's going to win. So, I mean, I don't know about you, Jake, but um, you know, people are going to be in tears at the end of this, no matter how much hard work they put in. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Uh, I think it's important to um, understand what team boss Brenton O'Brien said um, from Evolution Racing Team. And he said, you don't get any prizes for finishing first. If you finish first, if you finish 10th, the prize is the same. You get a place in that World Championship Grand Prix Series, and it doesn't matter if you win it, or if you finish ninth, or you finish fifth, it doesn't matter. As long as you're inside that top 10 and consistently scoring top 10s, you put yourself in that situation where you will have vehicles in that Road Pro Series. You've got to keep those vehicles clean. We were fortunate in that opening race that there weren't too many major incidents up towards the front. It's besides the fact of the lap traffic with the Eric Andre incident and Carlo Labarti with Sebastian Job, but it comes right down to it. You've got to be right at that top fighting and you've got to be clean as well. And Job last season failed to make it through Road to Pro with 20 drivers because he kept on finding himself in incidents. Yeah, he did. And yeah. that's the thing. You go on ahead, Johnny. Go on. I, I was just going to say one more thing is that you mentioned that Job didn't make the top 20. You know, this season, you've got to be prepared for all situations. If I racing decide in the end, okay, how about we make it top 20, which is what happened last year. If you're in P21, you've got to be fighting in that last round. Yeah, you might think, okay, top 10 is only going to get the license. But if I racing say, you know what, we actually want an extra 10 drivers. Let's gift it to P11 to 20. Be ready for it. So to finish P15, don't just give up on the series. And that really caught out Sebastian Job last year. And so um, that, that was a huge difference. You've got to be prepared for every situation. I would say, and we're just having a look at the pole lap, by the way, for Sebastian Job. This is what we've been showing you. His outlap and now his flying lap, just showing you just how picture perfect Sebastian Job has been in terms of our race here, uh, our qualifying session here today. And I would say one thing as well. I mean, as much as it will be coming down to the drivers here today, the point that you make there, Jake, about the team management is really important. There's different styles between course and racing, between Apex Racing UK and Annex Simpson, and then also to what we see in Evolution Racing Team, of course. They've expanded over the last 12 months, and Brenton O'Brien is trying to make this team a powerhouse, and the management styles, about as much as anything else, I think, will dictate not the entire championship, but a part of it. It definitely will, and that goes down to any team. Any great team has a great 
driver, and any great driver has a great manager behind that. How much of Lewis Hamilton's success over the last three years is down to Toto Wolff and Nicky Lauda? How much of Michael Schumacher's success was down to Jean Todd and Ross Braun? That's what you have to keep on thinking in the back of your mind. You always need, in any form of sport, someone who can motivate you, who does understand the business that you've got and push yourself to that highest level. And I think it's the team owners at the back who do the most work, the most effort, the most financing and sponsorship finding and whatever else it is. And they're the ones that make it happen above anything else. Because without the teams, you just have 30 drivers and it would come down to just pure skill. It's a lot more difficult than that. Indeed so. So we're going to step aside here on Racebot TV and on iRacing Live. Get ourselves ready for the race. We'll be back in just a few moments' time. Round number two of the iRacing Road Pro Series. Seas drivers set themselves to circuit Gilles Villeneuve. Your commentary team for this race, Jonathan Simon and Jake Sperry.
So 4.3 kilometers, 2.7 miles and 70 laps of racing coming up for round number two of the iRacing Road Pro Series. Minimal elevation change around Montreal and a very short pit lane loss time. The fact that the pit lane exit skips the first couple of corners with top speeds of up to 335 kilometers an hour. Two best overtaking spots here would be turn number one and turn number 10. But wait, what about that final chicane? You've got DRS available across that long casino straight and the main straight as Jake Sperry. We could have a very thrilling race here at Montreal. We always do here for any world championship event or any pro series event in history. Yeah, we certainly do. And you look back through history, Kazuki Mishima, how often it is documented and well noted about what happened with him. You've also got the likes of just consistent battles that happen up and down the fields in all different categories that we get. And with the qualify, well, the practice session, shall we say, just about coming to an end here, the race is going to be a very interesting one. Core dominate the front row again, but it's going to be all very, very interesting. Yep, let's have a quick look at the grid. So Frederick Rasmussen on the front row alongside Sebastian Job on pole position. Michael Dinkles and uh, Michael Dinkle and Rogers behind in third and fourth. The rest of the top ten is Preston, Simpson, Arbe, Partington, Williams and Oliveira. The rest of the grid on your screen, as you can see, it's been merged with those qualifying sessions. The drivers take to the grid. Now that strategy again, it's going to be a one-stop event as usual in the McLaren. The pit window opens on lap 28 onwards that's around the ideal pit stop range jake that's when we're going to see drivers into that pit lane for the first time even though it's a very short pit lane here two stop probably not the best option no uh, two stop definitely not an option with the cooler conditions that we got the track slightly risen here to 37 degrees but there's a heavy northwest wind here that's going to be causing a lot of issues for drivers here today when they get themselves down towards the likes of turn number one and that final chicane go very very careful boys this is going to be a long race indeed it's 270 meters from pole position to turn number one as we wait for the rest of the field to enter onto the grid. The lights about to illuminate. 70 laps of racing coming up here at Montreal. And we go green for round number two. What a start from Rasmussen, already ahead of his teammate Sebastian Job into the first corner. They file through, Rasmussen runs deep. What's going to happen to Michael Dinkle? He spun around and it causes chaos behind as all the drivers take avoiding action. Michael Dinkle's got a bit of damage. Oh, goodness me, as they head towards turn number three and four, it's still Rasmussen and Job firing away from the rest of the back. I think Michael Dinkle's out of the event now. This is catastrophe. It is catastrophe for Dinkle, and that means you're very unhappy here, Johnny, but a big, big moment. Two incidents, actually, in the opening two corners because we had another vehicle, an ERT machine, make a spin, but that's, this has completely opened up this race, especially at the very front of this field because now you would say it is a breakaway of four, and you look at drivers who's made positions in the early goings. Look at Boris Spolstra. He started third. He's now in sixth. Wow, what a start from Boris Spolstra into the hairpin. And he's made up a lot of positions. He's behind Joshua Rogers in that fourth position. The top two, though, of Rasmussen and Job. They'll come towards the final chicane one more time. And they will lead this first lap. So good start for them. It looked like Dinkel actually might have been collected by one of the drivers behind. And Job got awfully close here. But at the end of the first lap, it's the core duo who lead from Preston. Rogers, Boris Spolstra, thrilling start. What about Tommy Oscar from 14th on the grid? He's up into 6th. David Williams, 7th. Alex Simpson, he stays alive in the 8th position. And rounding out the top 10, it's Morris Lochner from 17th on the grid. Followed by Zoran Jonic, who started alongside him in the 18th position. And we said, go careful, go careful. And a lot of drivers didn't pay heed to that in towards a difficult turn one, turn two. And this will go down as a big shake-up in the event. So I'm keeping my eyes out here on certain battles right now. The likes of Juho Arbe against Massimiliano Fakara for P11, P12. In front of that, Zoran Jonic of the Orion race team. Arguably the bridge between the gaps right now between himself and Moritz Lohner. And what drivers need to be careful of in these early stages is just losing out as Arbe gets all shades of wrong through the second chicane, the third chicane even, shall we say, with Oliveira now waiting to try and get a chance to go down the inside. Yeah, the very bumpy braking zone of turn number 10. And Arbe 
finds his way through. Now, Diogo Oliveira and Yuho Abe, very experienced here in Grand Prix Series racing and the Pro Series too. It could be very difficult to overtake though, Jake, as we see those trains starting to develop. Everyone's going to have DRS. Everyone's going to deploy ERS here on these two main straights. It's just, yeah, it's going to be quite a challenge to say the least. It will, and overtakes now will be all about a premium, getting within three tenths of a second out of the hairpin, and especially where more dirty air effect is created, because all these vehicles will be running with a lot less downforce. The train all stacks up behind Boris Spolstra, and Tommy Oscar, Ducky, is the first person who will have the opportunity to make that move into the rights and left. And, well, he gets himself a nice good run there through the right-hander into the uh, left-hander, into the right now of turn number seven, now heading towards eight and nine i think boris bolster knows that time is inevitable between him and tommy oscar yeah exactly oscar though is on the attack here only lap three of 70 so he's uh, definitely trying to get a move on because that top four is starting to break away this group's three seconds behind josh rogers in the fourth position and tommy oscar looks feisty drs is available for the drivers now at this stage of the race oscar will come through that first zone flicks it on will climb all the way up to 330 kilometers an hour for Tommy Oscar spotting the braking zone in that final chicane but just no way through at all so Oscar and Spolstra they started on that seventh row together in 13th and 14th and Oscar as for the second lap round in a row he gets awfully close here in the first couple of corners to Spolstra but there's just no way to get in front no, there isn't. And Tommy Osgaard, if you remember back to Interlagos one week ago, was the big charger through the field, made up positions to get to 11th. And this is massive points for his charge into the championship. Spolstra was disqualified for too many instant points, wasn't part of a team, struggled massively at Interlagos, now massively on the back foot, needing everything to happen. But a little bit further in front of that, Riley Preston's starting to drop off a of Sebastian Job here. If he's not careful, he'll fall outside of one second, lose the DRS, and and ultimately end up in limbo. Yeah, Rally Preston back with Evolution Racing. Part of them before, left for a bit to Orion, rejoined them again. Oh, He's currently no best of the rest. And look at Alex Simpson here. Very close behind Core Motorsports, Moritz Lohna. Both of them have DRS. And Alex Simpson, what can the experience do here into the final chicane? Not much. He lost the position actually down at the hairpin there. Johnny Lochner just charged one down the inside and said, you know what? I'm going to catch team boss Alex Simpson sleeping there a little bit. So Simpson now will have to work about making sure that he gets himself back into position in this big train. And this is the thing. You can't afford to drop too many positions because this is the top 10 that you start to drop back 11th, 12th for Cara and Abe. You start dropping positions going backwards. There's only one way you go from there. Yep, there's dirty air as well affecting these drivers through this middle part of the lap. So difficult here as they head towards there's turn number six. Moritz Lochner is all over the back of David Williams here on this May or this back straight. Oscar as well. Hopefully he doesn't get too impatient behind Boris Spolstra. For that gap we mentioned earlier, Boris Spolstra was three seconds behind Josh Rogers. He's now five seconds behind. He was about 1.1 seconds slower than Josh Rogers, who's matching Freddie Rasmussen's pace there in the lead. So Josh Rogers and Riley Preston, the two Aussies, keeping those two in front of honest. And through the back straight here, let's see what they can do. Yeah, and well, it's all about what you can do and what sort of moves you can do. And well, again, Spolstra unable to be overtaken here by Tommy Ostgard as Ostgard again does an amazing job of just holding himself in position, looking for the opportunities, the right moments. One vehicle down on pit road is Takane Suzuki for the second time in a row. Another driver out, Michael Dinkel. It's Van Ballo, one lap down as things stand right now. So a lot of drivers struggling and actually has an incident at the back of the field. And that's with Benjamin Lindsay of the TNT machine. Lindsay running into all sorts of issues at the wall of the champions. Oh, goodness. So, Lindsay there. Oh, it looked like there was a slow ERT car in front. It was Carlo Labati. Lindsay had nowhere to go. Labati tried to avoid that wall of champions. Didn't want to be a champion at all. And 
Yeah, that's unfortunately collected ben Benjamin Lindsay, who had nowhere to go. So Labati continues unscathed, Jake. It's just the luck of the draw sometimes here around Montreal. It is the luck of the draw. And actually, something I want to keep an eye out on, Preston's been dropped by Sebastian Job. And now Job thinking about Rasmussen in front, almost a carbon copy of what happened at Interlagos. A poor start for Job, about Job trying to fight back through the field and then just about placing his vehicle and waiting for an opportunity to get past teammate Frederick Rasmussen, another two tenths yep. off of Rasmussen. And here's Yuho Abe into the wall of champions is Abe. Oh, goodness. He tried to go alongside. I, I can't remember who that was. I think it was Massimiliano Ficara, possibly. It was. And we're going through the final chicane alongside each other. And Abe was... He got a small, small little tap, didn't he, Jake? Had nowhere to go. Yeah, and it, just in front of that as well, David Williams had to bail out of the chicane. So he's dropped back two positions because of it as well. A nightmare final chicane for a lot of drivers then. And that's going to shake things up because now on the back of Yuho Abe is Josh Thompson of Radicals Online. Is Martin Van Loosnord of the Evolution Racing Team. And now positions becoming more fruitful. Opportunities being presented. Mistakes you can't make in the World Championship or the license becomes a begging. Yeah, and Sebastian Job struggled through that final chicane as well. He's pushed a little bit too hard. And I think the dirty air isn't helping him either because he's been very close to hitting that wall. He's backed off a couple of times. But right now, the leaders, if you want to follow this race on racebot.tv forward slash timing, you can see the lap times. Sebastian Job, the quickest of the field, a 16.8 last time around. A lot quicker than Boris Poulter is 17.8. So Boris right now is holding up a mad train of drivers behind. Rapid start, but just can't maintain the pace, Jake. So things just got a lot more interesting for this event. They certainly do, and that means that Boris Bolstra, for the amount of time that he'll be losing, he'll be now starting to put everyone else's races under jeopardy as things stand. And that means that for Spolstra, he's got to be careful. He's got to make sure that he just holds it up as much as he can, gets that pit stop window, and have that good pit stop window. That's the big issue that Spolstra's facing. Because the one pit stop comes into play, he may lose it. And there was a look from Oscar in towards the left-hander, but it was well scouted by the driver of Spolstra. He was not going to have him lost. But again, look at Oscar now. He's a lot closer than he ever has been. And again, has another opportunity. Does he send one down the inside? He thought about it. And look at Spolstra go off. No, he's broke under pressure there, Boris Spolstra. He's lost an incredible amount of positions. But what about Alex Simpson? He's right behind Moritz Lochner. Will he do the same that Moritz List do, <laughs> did to himself? Excuse me. But no, Simpson doesn't send a dive bomb into the hairpin. I was lost for words there, Jake, almost. A lot of action taking place. Boris Spolstra has also lost another position to Zoran Jonic. He could claim it back here. DRS open and engaged. And, and into the final chicane. Yeah, just about through. Lovely move from Boris Spolstra to recover that position against Zoran Jonic. If he's not careful, he'll lose a second to the drivers in front. Simpson, Lohner, Ostgard. Now Ostgard in that top five. Now has to prove his defensive capabilities against Moritz Lohner, who started 17th, mind you, and is already up 11 positions in nine laps. That just shows you just how quick he has been in this race. Yep, and so... We'll be able to see Tommy Oscar's true pace this time out because he's got a clean slate of air in front for the first time this race. But Josh Rogers last time out was the quickest of the top four. So Rasmussen, Job, Preston and Rogers, your top four separated by three and a half seconds. And I don't want to read into strategy too much, Jake, because it is early on in the event, but Rasmussen and Job could potentially need to work with each other here to manage those two behind because they are keeping them honest yes co-on sometimes it is described because you're fighting each other but you have to work together in order to hold everyone off and i think now this race actually is decided by josh rogers in fourth position if he decides to pit early and decide to come down make that stop get the fresh tires working that puts Joven Rasmussen at a little bit of a disadvantage if the tire degradation goes off a lot I don't really think it has been during this week so it's not too much forthcoming of a move but Riley Preston just needs to stay within one second it's 1.4 right now if he's not careful he starts dropping further back he lost again two tenths on that last lap to Job who's now trying everything to just get past Rasmussen and Tommy Oscard matched the leader's pace last time out. So finally, clean air for Tommy Oscard. He's broken away from the core motorsports car of Moritz Lochner, and he's got some rapid pace in him. 
So PSL finding a jam in Tommy Oscar in a pretty decent first round, even better for round number two for Tommy Oscar. He started from 14th on the grid, the seventh row. Moritz Lochner was on row number nine. Yes, row number nine, excuse me. He's in P17. Row eight, so, John. Row eight. No, it was a row eight. No, 17, 18. That's row nine. Oh, yeah, it's row so, nine. Yeah, I got you there, Jake. My next yeah. question is, what I don't want you to, to get this wrong, is can Sebastian Job get past Rasmus in his time out? Maybe not. Job's almost spun. Oh, I told you he was mucking up that final corner, and he almost did it again. Now he's under the clutches from Riley Preston. He got lucky, Johnny. He got lucky hitting too aggressive into that first part of the corner. And as such, he's dropped one and a bit seconds on that last lap in 18-3 because of it. And it happens just like that. There's the chance now for Rasmussen to break away, just to be very comfortable in the way that he's driving. He forced Sebastian Joe to push at 100%. It didn't work for him. Now Riley Preston, arguably what some would dub the unluckiest man in sim racing over 2017 now needs to start making progress and get rid of that moniker. Yep, Giuseppe Ragusa's around now at the first couple of corners. Oh, man. That's a, the worst corner you could spin a car around here. Or possibly the final chicane, too. But it looked like he was in a battle with... Zelensky. Zelensky, wasn't it? Into the first corner, so... Oh, it looked like contact. contact. between the two, and then, yeah, he was sent around, wasn't he? And um, just an unfortunate incident again. It was... Not similar to what happened to Dinkle, but contact at the first couple of corners. Yeah, contact at the first couple of corners. I think Zelensky may be a little bit too aggressive into one, had nowhere to go to two. Vehicle turned around, though, at the a hairpin there, I do believe. And that's Massimiliano Ficara of the Thrustmaster Movano team. Just looking at that one as well here, Johnny. Gets himself into that section. Maybe a little bit of misdemeanors with David Williams. Not too sure if there was contact between them, but Ficara drops at least six positions now, side by side with Dan Brewer. Dan Brewer is very feisty. He's going to search for the position, but no way through. And he's actually compromised his own exit because here's Matteo Calestani. And Calestani there in the PSR car. Where is he going to go? He's got the inside line. Brewer, though, maintains space around the outside, sends him wide. And Matteo has nowhere to go on the exit. So Brewer maintains P16. Good little scrap there between the two. And uh, a head up in the field. Boris Bolstra now, again under attack from Zoran Jonjic. Zoran, I think Jake will be lamenting the fact that he lost that position to Boris because he had him just for a few seconds. He did, and now he's been stuck for at least three, four laps, and he'll be looking for a way to make his way up into position number eight. Jonjic needs these positions. He's passed from an Orion team, which is looking a lot more strong after world's fastest game of the work that Ilka Harpler and David Corpse managed to show. He needs to sort of find that same level of aggressiveness that the pair of them found. And look at this, right tucked in underneath the toe, will have the opportunity of using the DRS and the ERS, but you can see Spolstra uses ERS to defend down this straight. All of it, let's go of it when he hits that apex. And well, there's nothing that he can do in response. He's very slow on this main straight, Boris Spolstra. He doesn't have DRS as well. You can see by the end of the straight, he starts to recover some energy, and that's where Jonjic starts to catch up, but can't make his way past. Now, if you are following our live timing at racepot.tv forward slash timing, you'll notice the top four, none of them have DRS. They've all broken that one second barrier range. The first driver in the field to have DRS, it's actually Moritz Lochner is right behind Tommy Osgaard. So Tommy still lapping at the same pace as the leaders. So is Moritz Lochner. Alex Simpson around the same pace as well. And, and, and what's Alex Simpson's goal now at this stage of the race, Jake? Because at the moment, all these battles around Montreal, such a tight racetrack, the last thing he wants to do is not finish the race. Well, he's got heavy front wing damage from what I can see. I don't know how much that is affecting him during this event. So he may have to come down, make a front wing change, come back out again. And that for Alex Simpson drops him back at least another six seconds on the field. And that puts him around the clutches of Diogo Oliveira, Martin Van Luzenwald, the battle for the top 10. I think for Alex Simpson, it's about consolidation, keeping the pace working the way that he needs it to be, and actually just trying to hold on to Moritz Lohner for as long as is possibly sustainable. Yep, so lap 14 to 70. There's plenty of time remaining in this event. As 
Rasmussen, one and a half second advantage over his teammate Sebastian Job, who had a moment there in that final chicane. I think every time Sebastian Job will come to that final corner now, there'll be less and less confidence over the next few laps. He's going to build that lap after lap, Jake, as the race progresses, because right now in that first stint, I am not confident of Sebastian Job going through the final couple of corners at Montreal. I take him a couple of laps just to calm himself down before he really starts pushing again. Just make sure he finds that rhythm again and gets himself moving forward, doing what it is that he needs to do during this event just to keep himself calm and able to just keep making those moves. But again, back to Spolstra. The train has joined up again behind Jonjic, Williams, Oliveira's there, Van Luznord's there, Arbe, Thompson, seven car train, all within that one second of each other, all looking to try and make the moves on one another. And again, Spolstra just very good good at getting the run out of the hairpin and making sure that Zoran Jonjic doesn't have a chance in towards these chicanes. Jonjic, a very much a wide line, big wiggle from Williams just behind. Yep, so David Williams also trying to make his way through. So Williams didn't have the greatest of starts. He's dropped a position and of course he was avoiding the incident at the start as well. So let's go on board with Zoran Jonjic. He's going through these first couple of corners. Let's listen in to him. You can see, Jake, he made a mockery of turns three and four, but then I just think Spolstra has no pace at all, and Jonic just catches back up. He just can't get past, and that's what's costing him now. He's lost six seconds to Alex Simpson. Doesn't matter how much pace Boris Spolstra has, the big defining factor is Boris Spolstra has position number eight on circuit. And there's not much you can argue against that in this situation. Not much you can say Boris Spolstra is doing wrong here as he holds up Jonjic through the hairpin, gets the run, gets back going again. Simpson thought about just ahead, the move on Moritz Lohner. Lohner has enough draft to close back up to Tommy Osgaard in that little scrap that's happening. No moves being done. And Osgaard, well, not even Osgaard, Jonjic having another little look into the final chicane. And it's a shocker run for the driver of Spolstra. Here now comes Williams. Williams as well, trying to attack the bunch. But what about Jonjic? He's going to go around the outside. Williams patient. Jonjic has the inside into turn number two. What can David Williams do? Will he go up the inside? No, he's fallen behind. But Jonjic and Spolstra battle away. And Zoran Jonjic flies through into P number eight. What well, a huge wiggle on the exit. Like, whoa, goodness me. That caught me unaware too. And My so I goodness. think I think Jonjic has sealed it. There we go, Jake. He's finally sealed P number eight. Just and just about Zoran Jonjic just living on the ragged edge. And that vehicle, those rear tires, will not be very happy heading on forward in this event. And well, it's very evident to see just how much Boris Spolstra is struggling here in this event. He will very easily, I think, drop outside the top 10 if he is not too careful about how the rest of this event is going to be going for him. And right now, I just want to focus on Tommy Osgaard right now because still Moritz Lohner thinking about it, but he's harvesting ERS all the way down the straight right now. I think he's waiting for a big charge right now. Yep, so let's see what happens. He's very far behind. Alex Simpson close behind two in P7. Goes through turn number one. You trail break into that first corner. Just a touch of the curb. Spolstra. Whoa! Almost clipped. Zoran Jonjic. What a move there from Boris Spolstra. And someone's around near the back. And Zoran Jonjic. He's into the wall. Jonjic oh. into the wall there in that battle. Oh, he tried to maintain the speed, but he just lost it on under acceleration, it seemed there, Jake. Yeah, he was too aggressive into turn number one, trying to apply the power, talk oversteer. The vehicle was never settled, and John Jitch pays the price. He's turned around and again finds himself at the hands of Boris Spolstra. Not necessarily his fault, but now he's down in P15 out on circuit, and that will massively frustrate him. And there's another vehicle that's been turned around, Johnny. Yep, so it was Daniel Brewer, and unfortunately for Daniel, he's currently in the P20, well, 23rd position behind Richard Arno and Daniel Brewer, who is uh, very experienced, maybe not in eye racing, but very quick in any open wheel car. It's not the best outing for him today. And we only have a couple of retirements too. We know what happened to Michael Dinkle, to Kane Suzuki and Benjamin Lindsay. There are our three main retirements. Isfran Below, unfortunately, our last runner 
in P34, who's still out on the racetrack. He's already a lap behind, so a bit of damage for him to uh, deal with for the rest of this event. But have a look at Martin Van Luzenord here, very close to Yuho Abe into turn number one. This is a scene of a lot of... You could start building a lot of graveyards into turn one, Jake. It's a lot of race-ending maneuvers for a lot of drivers. It is, and it's a very, very difficult corner to try and negotiate as everyone is stuck behind the Spolstra shuttle as things stand instead of what would be a truly train, you could argue. So right now, I think everyone's just trying to jostle for position. The pit stop window opens in about 10 laps time or so. But I would argue, maybe go in on lap 28 or something. Maybe try and extend the tyre life by about three laps or so. Get yourself away from this train. Get yourself in clean air. A lot of drivers will be considering going early because of Spolstra. So lap 18 of the event. We're a quarter of the distance through this one. And it's Frederick Rasmussen who leads by 2.9 seconds ahead of Sebastian Job. The two core sim racing cars in front, followed by Riley Preston and Joshua Rogers. Tommy Oscar rounds out our top five. He was stuck behind Spolstra for most of the event. He's 10 seconds behind Josh Rogers. Moritz Lochner, he's in the core motorsports car. No relation to core sim racing in the top two. We'll identify them. The core motorsports is in that purple and yellow livery. Core sim racing in orange. And the driver's behind in some good little scraps here. Alex Simpson, seventh. Boris Spolstra, eighth. Defending from David Williams. Williams had an attack there into the first couple corners. Jorgo Oliveira in tenth. He's got a train behind him of Yuho Abe, Martin Van Luzenord, and Josh Thompson in the Radicals online car. What about Massimiliano Ficaro in P14? He's been all over the place this event. He started in 16th, currently in 14th. And Zoran Jonjic, after his spin, rounds out the top. 15 with Bobby Zelensky close behind. So Jake, still plenty of time towards those first pit stops. Drivers are going to start to, to push in this third stage of the stint. You know, this is where, I mean, you said the last round, Apex have a knack of dropping off in terms of race pace. Is this what's happening to Alex Simpson at this stage? No, it was a mistake, actually, in towards that second chicane around turn eight, turn nine, last lap. He got really close to the back of Moritz Lohner, had to bail out of the corner, and P9, the battle going on right now. Williams versus Spolstra, side by side. Nothing Spolstra can do. David Williams, as accomplished as you like for an ex-World Championship driver, but look at the run on the exit that Spolstra's going to get side by side again. Thank you very much. Spolstra caught him absolutely napping with all the cookies in the jar as well no oh, you can't beat heart and soul maybe yes because david williams back into p number eight he lost it for just a few seconds boris bolster though he is lacking pace but he's not lacking any heart he's brilliant today in terms of defense he's currently in p9 though and he's falling more and more he's gonna have to fight with his ert teammate of diogo Oliveira next I think there'll be not too much disinterest between the pair of them. I think Spolstra may let Diego Oliveira through because he's got that better opportunity to fight for it. Unless Spolstra wants to prove his worth in a brand new team, he may not be doing many favours in that. But I have to say, it has been some great, great scraps going on for this top 10. And this final position could mean all the world right now to Diego Oliveira if he makes that move. The crucial factor, though, will be Yuho Abe just behind. Van Luzenord runs deep. Oh my goodness. So Martin Van Luznord. What's going to happen to him now? He's still going to run here on Josh Thompson. No on the straight. So big news by the way. Dan Brewer. Catastrophic incident with Giuseppe Ragusa. And he's out of the event. That was at turn number one and two yet again. The corner that's catching out a lot of drivers here. Van Luznord gets tail happy though. Out of the hairpin. Oh sorry. No, no, the final chicane. Excuse me. And into the first couple of corners here on lap 21 as they begin another time good test of, of mental strength isn't it jake sim racing because you always just want to take a break and relax that's the likes of what probably you know some of these drivers who have a big advantage front and back do the likes of tommy oscard he can't take a break he's got moritz lochner all over the back of him this is just such a tough mental challenge for someone like him 
It is, and when you're dealing with 70 laps as well, this is a tough challenge for what is half the race. He's been having to think about it constantly for about half an hour, and that's going to be playing into the minds of drivers. When will the mental resiliency, those mental walls, start breaking down on certain drivers as they look to try and make charges back through the field? Again, Spolstra under pressure from Diego Oliveira, and I don't think there's team orders in play here. I think Oliveira's got to do it the long way, the difficult way. The actually, I've got to make an overtake way because Boris Bolstra is not going to bow down for no man I don't think today yeah if you were doing team orders it would be like air traffic control there's so many EIT drivers out there you wouldn't know who to talk to so Oliveira he can't get his way past Boris Bolstra are you afraid of Boris Bolstra right now he's just so tough to get past you know he, I think he's set the scene for, for his driving style. It's just about the pace that he needs to improve. I, I wouldn't say afraid. I, I don't think drivers are afraid of Spolstra. I, I think that they understand that Spolstra did very well in the opening stages, but I, I think that it is the overall pace that he needs to work on. His race pace needs a little bit of handiness with it, and I think ERT will certainly help him with that and getting used to a very difficult machine like this one. So... I think that Spolstra will improve with time. I think he'll get better and better. It's just about how much he'll get better and better in the next few stages of his career. Through the hairpin they go. The Pongal as it's known. And then past turn number 10 on towards the Casino Straight. 14 corners at Montreal. Six of them to the left, the other eight to the right. For this 70 lap event coming up we're doing a full grand prix distance for every single event here for the iRacing road pro series now don't forget if you do have an iRacing license the one and two year membership renewals are now discounted by 25 percent through december 6 2017 so um, definitely get involved it's the blacks saturday black holiday sales black saturday sales what are they jake i'm australian black, I don't friday. Even know black friday that's it <laughs> we, don't, we don't do that here uh, one year renewal only $82.50 two years 149.25 big discounts over the regular prices so definitely renew and get involved in iRacing we have the Pro Mazda Championship before this thrilling race and you could join these guys next year in the Pro Series and you could potentially be a world championship driver in 2019 so definitely get involved in the McLaren MP430 so take the McLaren it's a very difficult car to master, but you only reward the best if you get it right. And that's the likes of what uh, Martin Kronke has done. And for this race, it's the likes of what Freddy Rasmussen's done. It certainly is. And if you really sort out this vehicle, you know what it is that you consistently have to get right. And Rasmussen has done that very well, pulling out a gap of 3.3 seconds. It also has to go saying that if you get rewarded, maybe even teams like McLaren want to try and reward you. World's fastest game of finals going on today. So I think we would all like to wish the likes of Gregor Hutu, Bonner House, Isaac Price and Frank Schothorst all the best of luck in their challenges. But... This is the thing, though, that everyone does. This is the bread and butter, the day-to-day -day that everyone wants to get into because it doesn't matter how good you are off a full race series. You've got to do it in a world championship. You've got to go prove yourself, and there's a lot of drivers wanting to prove themselves right now. For example, Van Luzenor versus Fakara. Yep, exactly. Massimiliano Fakara close behind. Some battles away down the back end of the order. Enric Andre... Attacked by Giuseppe Ragusa, Fabrizio Giobbi as well in P25. The two Italians there, the two teammates, trying to work together to get past Enric. Enric Andre has driven through race spot race day in the past. Fairly young driver, so he's trying to make a name for himself. And for those young guys out here, Jake, yeah, they may not get the World Championship license as it looks, but this experience is just so vital and critical for him. Exactly. You need to be racing against the best to improve yourself against the best. And that's what drivers further down the field, like maybe Bobby Zelensky needs, who's not a natural when it comes to a McLaren MP430, as he battles his way with a Roscoe, with the likes of Zoran Jonjic just in front, for Cara Van Luznord a little bit down the road. Drivers need to be racing with good drivers. As Actually, I'm looking at a battle further down, even further. Nicholas Rasmussen versus Richard Arnault. This one, P21, P22. Uh, double deuce and blackjack positions apply. Rasmussen again, proving difficult defense. But Arnault sends one down the inside of one. Rasmussen the inside for two. 
Yep. Hung's him out to dry, doesn't he? Richard Arno, no grip there. Eh? With iRacing's dynamic track doing all the work here. You can see the track starting to rubber up more and more as we approach that first pit stop phase for our one-stop strategy this race. So definitely a challenging point of the event as the tires start to wear off. The cars are a little bit heavier, so drivers will tend to come in before that 50% distance mark of lap 35. But if you're a leader, Jake, this is where it becomes difficult. If you pit and you are Freddy Rasmussen, as you Abe now very close to Josh Thompson, you will file behind a mad scrambling back the likes of Yuho Abe you'll have to contend with. Yeah, and Yuho Abe lost the position actually down at the hairpin, similar to Simpson Lohner earlier on in the event. Diving down onto the lane, though, just in front of them is Diogo Oliveira. He's going for the undercut on lap 25 very early for that first stop, but I think he needs to get out of Spolstra's way to make sure that he gets himself a good opportunity. Good move from Josh Thompson, though, down the inside. Very good from a driver who has struggled over recent seasons with keeping a vehicle on the island. I think Radicals is suiting and complementing him very well. Yeah, this is more of a strategic than scheduled pit stop for Diogo because he was stuck behind Boris Bolstra there. So he pitted a few laps earlier than the window. And it's a very long pit stop, isn't it, Jake, for Diogo Oliveira? A bit of damage to repair. Yeah, it was a long stop. And just looking at that stop and just looking at what he had coming into the box. Yes, the front wing, the front right, very much hurt. He gets out and away again, so he needed to make it early in front of his old teammate, Manu Domingo. So in P26, he now finds himself. And the good thing is a little bit of clean air to Victor Preto just in front. Yeah, Manuel, I've raced with him a couple of times back when I was with PSR. Very nice guy. And he's always showing up here and there, always makes the top split. Got a lot of work to do, though, to improve. So he's currently in P27, started this race in P19. Hasn't been the best start for him, obviously, dropping a lot of positions. Those leaders, though, nobody else is ready to enter the pit lane at this stage of the event. And now, just having a look at other battles throughout the field. Alex Simpson's closed back in on Moritz Lochner. He seems to be held up by Tommy Oscar, Jake. He does, and Tommy Osgaard hasn't been bad in this event. I don't think he's been racing at a too uh, difficult pace for what has been done, but the comparison from Alex Simpson, who was doing 17-2, 17-5s over the last few laps, I, I think Alex Simpson's the fastest man of the three right now and wants to get past, wants to get inside that top five, but... There isn't really a way that you can make those moves. And Tommy Osgaard, who has a lot of experience working with the likes of the, uh, the Formula Renault drivers back in the day, the likes of having that Clio Cup experience that he's had as a driver, he's using all of it here to keep Lohner at bay. Lohner closes in, but harvests the ERS when he knows that he's not going to be able to get a clear-cut side-by-side move into the final chicane. And again, a good run from Tommy Osgaard means there's no opportunities for the Hoitzenveld Cool Motorsports driver. Yep. So they're in front here, this group of David Williams and Boris Bolstra. Now, it may not be obvious, but Boris Bolstra actually has a bit of front wing damage, which could be the reason for a lack of a bit of pace here. Now, who's entered the pit lane? Bobby Zelensky, Martin Van Nord as well. They enter just as the pit stop window begins. It's hopefully a quick pit stop for this bunch. Van Luzenord has been very quick in the World Championship. He has finished in P number 12 before. That's been his career best result. He has to earn his way, though, back into the top flight. Enters his box. And fairly reasonable pit stop. Not quick enough. Now, remember, very quick exit here, Jake. They skipped the first couple of corners, but it looks like Van Luzenord's going to file in the back of the pack. Yeah, he's going to fall behind the Neric Andre at least. There's Diogo Oliveira, who will lose one position and lose two, maybe, to Bobby Zelensky. Side by side on the run to three. Oliveira has the inside line. I'm not sure how much Zelensky's going to fight, but he's going to try and chop the nose off of him there. And Oliveira loses the position. Disaster for the Brazilian driver. Yeah, brilliant stuff from Bobby Zelensky. He's quite confident turning in. Not into six, though. He ran way too deep in the braking zone. And now Oliveira with traction on this back straight. Heading to turn eight, breaking just as you see the shadow under the bridge. As Richard Arno here at the final corner. Uh, sorry, not the final corner, the hairpin, isn't it? They go through the main straight, so Arno will flick on DRS. He's got a shot here at P18. 
Will any of them into the pit lane? That's the question. It's a good chance to do so. They both break for the final chicane. And there's Rasmussen maintaining P18. I think there, Jake, it would have been good for Arno just to slot himself back into the pit lane and save a bit of time. Same way that Yuho Abe had to do it. And Abe looking like he was having maybe a little bit of an okay moment. Yes, just a very long wait to get to his pit box, but a long wait in the box as well. So Yuho Abe going to get himself out and away behind Van Luzen. A big move from Zelensky into one, holds off Oliveira. And Yuho Abe now behind all of that, behind Victor Preto as well. Side by side still, though. Look at Oliveira down to the inside of Zelensky. Not much you can argue against that. Bobby Zelensky, he tried everything to hold him back he tried but Oliveira was robust and he maintains or oh, he still finds his way past into p20 so Jogo Oliveira the experience counts and it matters he gets himself ahead of a very experienced oval driver is Bobby Zelensky Jake but he's very quick on the roadside now he's proving his worth he certainly is. Alex Simpson down on the lane in the 10. He has to repair the front wing. That's something that has to be remembered. But Alex Simpson down on the lane, that's a crucial one here, Johnny, because that releases himself comparatively to Lerner and Osgaard. That's a big worry. Do they respond? Well, let's see how long the pit stop is. Oh, the front wing's being changed. That's a long stop for Alex Simpson. Not what he wanted. David Williams behind also into his box. He's going to have a long pit stop. It's damage central here today, Jake. We're going to have some huge... I mean, the accountants are going to have to do their work after this event. There's a lot of front wing changes. Oh, there certainly are. And, well, there's going to be a lot to be said afterwards. Out comes Alex... Well, David Williams in front of Martin Van Luzenord. Out comes Fakara in front of Oliveira, very crucially. So Oliveira, another vehicle. He's now got to try and negotiate and navigate his way around. Alex Simpson in clean air. That's a worry for the likes of Oscar and Lona. Will either of them decide to dive down onto the lane this time by as they make their ways towards the final chicane? Oscar covers it. Lona follows. Searching for their box here. Very easy to get a speeding penalty at Montreal through that final corner it's under braking making sure you don't speed on pit lane entry hopefully these are quick stops for the bunch but thompson now i think i heard josh thompson actually clip the wall of champions there so hopefully no damage for josh thompson but what's happening to lochner he remains behind tommy osgard does in this situation very crucial for tommy osgard and the battle that he was wanting but look at who's trying to get out in front of them maybe alex simpson nowhere comparatively and there's kalistani in the middle of them as well that's a disaster for alex simpson he's now got to work to get back to lohner and lohner wanted to get past all of it heading through spolstra coming out of pit road as well he's behind martin van Luznord. if he's not careful he's just ahead of fakara and Oliveira. Yeah, that's important for Boris Spolstra. And it was a very long pit stop for him. So Boris did indeed have front wing damage. And that may have compromised his pace. So he's going to make sure for the rest of this race he doesn't sustain any more damage. So let's have a look at Boris Spolstra's real pace now. What about the leader, Sebastian Job, into the pit lane? Yeah, Sebastian Job then the first to blink out of the leading drivers. So Job looking to get the undercut on Frederick Rasmussen as things stand. Hits his box very nicely, a little slower than we would have expected, but still a very good stop out and away. Clean air as well. Rasmussen's got to be careful. Traffic of Lothoris in the gap SRT machine in front. And he does. It's going to affect him with a bit of dirty air too. So Lothoris... Is he going to get out of the way? He's certainly going to have blue flags waved into the hairpin. See if Rasmussen actually bites and enters the pit lane. So will anybody react to Sebastian Job stop? If I'm Preston and Rogers, this is almost a gift to them to have fresh rubber for the entire second stint. Even though they may lose initially on the undercut. Rasmussen into the box. Yeah, Freddie into the lane and very, very pedestrian hitting the line and needs to make sure that this stop is absolutely perfect in comparison to Sebastian Job. In comes Riley Preston from second position. In comes Josh Rogers. The leaders are all biting then. Those who haven't pitted have. Here comes Sebastian Job though. He's now heading towards the Wall of Champions. This is going to be very close between the two. Rasmussen has to wait an eternity. Now he leads this lap again. So Rasmussen's led every single lap of this event. Out in the way, very quick pit stop. Where's Sebastian Job? He's coming through the first couple of corners. 
It's going to be awfully close between the two, but Rasmussen... Oh, it's actually comfortable in the end. Very speedy away is Frederick Rasmussen. He's also got one lap of fresh rubber on Sebastian Job for the rest of this event. Good stuff from Freddy Rasmussen. The two behind are Preston and Rogers out and away. Now, did Rogers have a very long pit stop, Jake? It looked like it. It definitely did look like it because he was three seconds back of Preston. Now he's more like 10. I think that he had to change a front wing. I'll have to have a double look. And Josh Thompson has lost out to... Yeah, there was a front wing change. Yep, exactly. So I thought Josh Thompson actually lost out to Orozco, but it was actually... Uh, Orozco was later in the box. So Josh Thompson out in the way in the pit stops. He's currently battling here. Just behind Diogo Oliveira. And he's currently in P13. So most of the field enter the pit lane. There's a couple of drivers who haven't. The likes of Carlo Labati, for example. And others. Although Carlo Labati has just entered his box now. So everybody almost making a pit stop. Yeah, everyone almost making that stop. Likes of Lothoris out and away. Labati looking for the box. Montagna's in. Preto looking to get out and away. So you'd say that the pit stop window over at lap 33 may be a little bit surprising. It's over a little bit earlier. What's happened? And Zelensky running into issues. Oh, Zelensky straight past Josh Thompson. And there he is. Easy overtake in the end. Thompson had no speed at the exit of that turn eight nine chicane sebastian job as well he's very very quick he's almost in drs range now of freddie rasmussen so job there got the confidence on this set of pirelli rubber and he's going to get very very close come the drs zone he's got to maintain that one second gap doesn't he jake heading to the detection point and I talk about one second gaps. That's the gap between Job and Rasmussen. As things stand, Rasmussen misses the apex into the right hander, gets a good run out of the exit here. But now it's about Sebastian Job and how much he can close that gap down here, get within that one second window, have another opportunity at getting past Frederick Rasmussen. It went away from him in the opening stint. He's got to do it early and effectively, a clean cut, as it were. Yeah, and Josh Thompson's entered the pit lane, so. Something's gone on for Josh Thompson, whether it was a penalty, uh, probably was. And he's going to, well, I mean, he's all the way down in the dust now, P27. Oh, goodness, I can't even look at that anymore. I get a little depressed. Josh Thompson there, he's got a lot of work to, to do now to climb his way up. But Sebastian Job, much more happier. He's very close here. He hasn't led a lap here for this event. We're already almost halfway through. And Freddie Rasmussen's led all the laps, Jake. He has, and Freddie Rasmussen will be happy in that knowledge, but leading all the laps does not get you the race victory here. Doesn't score you any extra more points like the World Championship does. It just means that you've had control of the race up until now. This is a big challenge. He lost it at the opening round. Has he improved from one week on? Have a look. He runs much deeper through the hairpin. This time out, let's have a look at the front main, uh, the casino straight here, excuse me. DRS enabled. Has a look. He's very, very close. Oh, and that's the corner where he just runs deep there and almost touches the wall. He's not going to be close enough onto the main straight, but Rasmussen crosses the line. And that's 50% of the distance covered for round number two of the iRacing Road Pro Series for 2017 to 18. Freddie Rasmussen leads by four tenths of a second ahead of teammate Sebastian Job. The two core sim racing cars followed by the two Aussies of Riley Preston and Josh Rogers. Tommy Osgaard rounds out the top five. Then we have Lochner, Simpson, Williams, Van Luzenord, and Boris Spolstra behind in P number 10. Spolstra has been in every single battle you could imagine for this event. Massimiliano Ficaro in 11th. He's in that train along with Diogo Oliveira and Bobby Zelensky, followed by Zoran Jonic, who had a spin earlier on. He's also trying to attack Bobby Zelensky for P13. Yuho Abe rounds out the top 15. So this is Jonathan Simon in the commentary booth alongside Jake Sperry, Will Vincent behind the scenes, hosting and in production. And look how close Sebastian Job is this time around, Jake. Can he do it? 
Oh, he's thinking about it. He leads the door open and says, you know what? I could do it if I want to. Misses the apex, though, in the first part. Gathers it up nicely into the second part of the apex as he makes the run onto lap 37. Out of 70 on the brakes. One and two. Hoping just to have a little bit of safety as Fabrizio Gobbi will be the driver that will next be lapped in front of them. About two, three seconds down the road. So Rasmussen will have to be careful. We'll hope to catch that on the straight. Grab the DRS and just run away right now from Sebastian Job, And this is the thing. It's pressure by attrition. Yep, and the fuel's starting to degrease too. So if these drivers like a lighter fueled car, it's going to come to them towards the end of the event. And that could be what's happening to Sebastian Job at this stage. All 700 kilograms of the McLaren MP430 at their will. Job slightly twitchy through turn number eight and nine. The very bumpy braking turn of turn number 10, La Pongal. Spot on is Sebastian Job on the apex. Does he have a run here though? He'll flick on DRS shortly across this casino straight. He certainly will. And now Sebastian Job thinking about it, closing the gap. Four tenths, three tenths, two tenths. Not close enough. Down into the final chicane. Needs a solid run out to the exit. A little bit too aggressive there was Frederick Rasmussen in the opening part of that section. Gets away with it though. And Sebastian Job, it's another lap awaiting. But crucially enough though, it's still a lap where he's quicker. The gap down two tenths of a second over the line. Yeah, he's getting closer and closer. Preston's dropped behind. He's 11 and a half seconds behind this bunch. Rogers P4, he's six seconds behind Preston. So Riley looks to be in a calm, cool and collected final podium position if you can get it right. We had one commentary curse last round, Jake. Maybe we can have another one this round. So I don't want to say too much. I thought I said it about Boris Spolstra earlier on today when he had that moment. Oh, yeah, well, we got yeah, two, so we don't want a third one. <laughs> who, who knows? Oh, and look, Sebastian Jobs run deep. That's into turn eight. That's not a commentary curse, though. That's just Job butchering his own corner. He, get, he got away with it there, Johnny, and I think that's very crucial. He got away with that because he kept it on the racing surface. Didn't have to make a slowdown penalty. Dan Brewer is now out of the event officially, and that's going to be a shame for him overall and his run that he wants. But there's also a battle going on in Andre, uh, uh, and Eric Andre against Giuseppe Ragusa that they'll also have to negotiate, and that's going to be difficult because that's a battle that also has to be respected, Johnny. Yep, and Massimiliano Ficaro has lost a couple of positions too. Very slow out of that first chicane. But he's actually stayed ahead of Zoran Jonjic. Nothing goes well for Zoran Jonjic at Montreal for some reason. He's in P14 trying to defend from Yuho Abe. But behind Enric Andre. Four tenths behind Ragusa. They're heading into turn number six. Love turn number six here. You just throw the car into the corners. Easy to lose traction at turn number seven. You want to straighten the car up as early as possible. Using all the power possible. And Eric Andre goes through eight and nine. Now he's within DRS range of Giuseppe Ragusa. He'll have one blue light on the dashboard to illuminate and tell him DRS is available. The second blue light will illuminate to tell him that it's available to use. And then two more blue lights will illuminate when he engages DRS here on this casino straight. He's still very, very far behind though. No chance to overtake Ragusa. No chance there. And well, a poor run as well for Sebastian Job, your race leader. No chance of getting past Rasmussen on this section of circuit. But I am keeping my eye on that top 10 battle now as it's going to be Spolstra Oliveira yet again. But Martin Van Loosnord is struggling now in this second bit of the stint. And that's bringing Spolstra back into him, actually. So Spolstra for the first time in a long time on the offensive, Johnny. Yeah, well, I'm happy. You got that damage repair, that's why. So a different form of race for Boris Spolstra in the second half. Now, Freddie Rasmussen doesn't have a shot at the Grand Slam because Sebastian Job was on pole position this round. It was the opposite in round number one. But Freddie will be a complete rookie to the World Championship Grand Prix Series. And, well, no chance really to set a Grand Slam this race. No, oh, who's gone off? And oh. Boris Spolstra, he's lost a couple of positions to Van Luz, Norden, Oliveira. 
it was it was on the chicane there, Johnny, that we were looking at. He just got way too aggressive, went to the inside too late, had to straight line it, slow down as well, getting involved. And now look at this, side by side with Oliveira, three ERT machines having a massive ding-dong battle. Yeah, here they are through turns three and four. Starting his way past is Oliveira. Oh, man, they can't collide or else... Oh, they oh. do! Oh, Spolstra saves it. And look who's behind Bobby Zelensky, ready to pounce on this bunch. Zelensky ready to make his way through, but on this back straight. Very, very close. Oh, my goodness. And Spolstra here off the oh, race. That's a on its roof. That's Yuho Abe. Oh my goodness, I was just behind this massive group. He thought about making it three wide. Contact with, I believe, that's Michael Partington, I do believe. And he's up on his roof before the turn eight chicane. Yeah, he's hit the catch fencing too, hasn't he? And that's what sent him around onto the roof, Jake. That, that, that's scary. And thank goodness it's sim racing because that was a monumental incident. And Partington somehow still managed to make the corner in front of Jonjic. Oh, man. Michael Partington's currently in that 13th position. He started, Michael, in uh, P number eight. So he had a good qualifying performance. But um, certainly not what he wants. Certainly not what Yuho Abe wants. He's uh, been a very impressive driver. Former world championship driver too, Jake. Yeah, very impressive world championship driver. So... It's all about holding positions. It's all about making moves. And when you had that big train, six, seven, eight, you, you had to be careful. You had to be really careful about where you placed that vehicle. And the fact that an incident happened, I'd say that was inevitability for some drivers. For others, it would be about just holding station, holding position. Got to be careful about anything that happens. Still that battle for the lead rages on lap 42. Still Rasmussen just playing defense right now with Job. Job unable to really make any meaningful moves. Yeah, so Rogers had a very huge moment and almost lost his car too. He's 5.8 seconds behind Rally Preston. Oscar's actually caught up to Josh Rogers now. Let's have a look at the lap time. So I want to see how much Josh Rogers has lost last time out. He comes across the line. 16.5, is that updated? I think so. So yeah, 16.5 again. So... Uh, Oscar, though, five seconds behind Rogers. Quick pace for Tommy Oscar. He's always had it. Um, it was just how he was held up by the damaged Boris Folster early on in the event, Jake. That's cost Tommy Oscar time. It has, and it's very evident because you see drivers like Alex Simpson now struggling to get onto the back of Moritz Lothner, struggling to get back into this event in the P567 battle. So you're seeing already just how a lot of drivers are trying to work out where they are. And that lap one incident really did change the game, I think, for about half to two thirds of the field today. Good job. Very close behind Rasmussen here on the main straight. It's just getting past is the issue. But Murray Walker would say. And so into the first couple corners again. You can see the track starting to starting to rubber in a couple more. A, a, a bit more, sorry, Jake. And so that's where the marbles off the line. It's not really going to end your race but it's going to make things awfully difficult through montreal if you are on those marbles around the outside it's high racing's dynamic track doing all its work it is and that's always going to be very difficult having lowered levels of grip always trying to put yourself in a situation where you can make the good amount of moves that need to be done i want to keep my eye on zelensky though he started 24th he's plus 13 up to 11th he's got the top 10 just in front of him in diogo Oliveira, and behind that for cara partington jonjic that one's still very much training at the moment but still a very good battle scrap between them for what is p10 downwards in a race which has completely thrown the top 10 out of the window in my opinion johnny yeah Zelensky finished 17th at Interlago, so this is definitely going to be much better, but let's have a look what he can do now. Eight tenths behind. There's a huge train, though, Van Luznord all the way back to Ricardo Orozco, so that's P9 to P15. It's, um, yeah, a pretty big fight here, and Yuho Abe was in there before. Now, don't forget, Jake, actually, Yuho Abe has finished fourth before in the World Championship. He's had some strong results. That was back at Motegi in 2014, and so uh, one of his many Japanese home races he's been in. Um, he would have been in that fight too, but unfortunately he's joined a long list of retirements that include Jorge Montañez, Dan Brewer, Sergio Lorenz, 
Benjamin Lindsay, Takane Suzuki, Michael Dinkle, and Aurelian Talamon. And oh my goodness, yes, there was uh, Michael Partington running into issues at the final chicane, almost getting himself through, gets himself a big slide, keeps it together, but Michael Partington getting very aggressive, not what we saw from yesterday where David Williams tried to go down the inside on the last lap and Partington was very cool and collected, Partington's being too aggressive today, Johnny. Yep, Jake's talking about the Grand Prix Series race that went on, so uh, right now Partington not having the best of races. I've seen better from Michael Partington, but hey, he's still out in the way there, collecting some points. They could be critical come the end of the season. Look at Sebastian Job, though, through turn number two and three. Only a couple tenths behind Freddy Rasmussen. Through the first chicane they come. I feel, Johnny, it's about setting up at this situation. Job is setting up Rasmussen. He doesn't want to do it too early or too late. He's got all the time in the world with the 13-second gap to Riley Preston. It's about when. It, it, you feel it's not an if situation. And if it's a case of Joe can't make it, then big congratulations to Rasmussen. Battle in front of them, though, is Kalistani and Rasmussen, the other Rasmussen. They'll have to negotiate both of them before the move is done. Yep, no relation at all, so it uh, won't help. But Sebastian Job's so close here. I think he's got the best shot he's had all race. Through the hairpin they come. Job will have DRS. How close will he get here on the back straight? Up to 340 kilometers an hour for Sebastian Job. Has a look at the lead here on Rasmussen, but there's no way through. Job will have round number two here on the main straight. DRS open and engaged. Oh, you can see just how Job wants to make that move. Thinks about the inside, has a half-hearted attempt, but it doesn't work for him. And that's the closest he's been all race long to taking that race lead back again. Sebastian Job will be frustrated at the fact that he hasn't made it, but there's traffic to help him in the next couple of moments. Yep, and Ricardo Orozco out of the event after a collision with Massimiliano Ficaro at the first chicane. And unfortunate, there were a few cars that may have collected him behind, but Orozco joins our list of retirements. But he set that move up exceptionally, didn't he, Jake? And I think it's just the run out of the hairpin wasn't ideal for Job. So if there's anywhere to improve, it was just getting the traction coming out of turn number 10. Yeah, it's just about getting the perfect run here out of a very difficult section with such low downforce. Getting the power back down is always very difficult to apply yourself in this vehicle. That's what Sebastian Job has been struggling, but this is the issue. He is very close, but look at who's in front getting tow. There's Kalistani, there's Rasmussen, the other Rasmussen having their own scrap. They'll have to let by the leading pair right now as they head themselves through the final section of corners. But this is the nightmare that, Ras that Frederick Rasmussen didn't want. He doesn't want to be dealing with traffic at this stage. But he knows at this stage, it also stops Sebastian Job from making any progress. Yep, it does. So, Job still hasn't led a lap of this event, by the way. But this lap traffic bunch in front. Oh, man. Oh, get out of the way. Come on, guys. There's Matteo in front. Kalistani. Where's he going to let Rasmussen go? Oh, this is going to be tight. Job's going to run here at the lead, I think. Oh, his exit's compromised. And I think, you know what, that's fair anyway there, Jake, because you don't want Rasmussen to gain a disadvantage or, or Job the other way to gain an advantage from lap cars. Yeah, there wasn't really too much you could do there if your name was Matteo Calastani. He let him through at a very safe point of the circuit there. There wasn't really the room to do it at turn four, turn five. Nicholas Rasmussen will go straight on, but I think he's been too casual doing that because he loses the position to Calastani. Gets the better run, though, coming off of the exit and will use that as an advantage to make the move back again. But Job... Getting caught in the traffic there, unable to make things happen. There's also a battle just in front, almost contact there between Arnaud and Sadler. Yep, and any contact, it would have been with the leaders. Look at Rasmussen close to the wall. No contact, though. Here's Job going for the lead here on lap 47. Beginning lap 48, nowhere through for uh, Sebastian Job. Rasmussen maintains the lead. So there may have actually been contact there, Jake, although it was very close. And the other Rasmussen, Nicholas Rasmussen, having a massive incident with Kalistani straight into the wall and out with the incident limit as well. So two big moments for two different Rasmussens. One got away with it, the other involved in a major incident. Yep. So two big fights there going on at the same time. Um, now, 
We didn't miss it. I saw it just slightly. Freddy Rasmussen, not Nicholas. Freddy had DRS there from the lap cars, so that did help him just a bit. And he went into that final chicane quite hot. So that extra speed was a bonus. And then it just caught him unaware in the braking zone. You know, these core sim racing cars, Jake, are going up to 340 kilometers an hour. They certainly are. And when you have 47 laps without DRS, suddenly the one lap you do, you start overcooking it. You've got to be careful about it. Here comes round two, though. Sebastian Job closes, not close enough, into the final chicane, looking for another opportunity. But again, more traffic in front. And this is the bad traffic. Domingo, Arno, Sadler. And in front of that, if they're not careful, they may hit the Spolstra train soon uh, before the end of this event. And now into one to again, Rasmussen, cool and calm, even through mistakes. Yep, so the two young men, Sebastian Job, only 17 years of age. He's still got a lot of potential to extract, but you know, he's a very quick driver. He just can't find a way past the other young... He's not even a prospect anymore, isn't he, Jake? He, Freddie Rasmussen's one of the top drivers in sim racing right now. I wouldn't call him a prospect. I'd call him a young prodigy. That's what I'd say yeah. about Frederick Rasmussen That's a better way to put it. and just how good he is. Some would say he is right now the Mozart of sim racing, and he's certainly proving that as he's making Sebastian Job behind him dance to his merry little tune. And there's only 20 laps to go here in this event, so opportunities now. Job's losing them a little bit and runs wide off of the exit, unable to get the same run that Rasmussen does. We won the casino straight again. Rasmussen. Uh, this is where Job now again, 335 this time around. So ERS not entirely available for Sebastian. Now on the main street, there's a couple of lap cars to make this episode of core sim racing battles once again more interesting. Who's that off the racetrack? Oh, no. No, that's Enric Andre, isn't he? That's oh, Arnaud. No. Was it Richard Arnaud? Oh, excuse me, his teammate. So. Um, the two core sim racing cars have one more lap car to deal with before some clean air. It's the young Alex Sadler who's joined Radicals. Good to see Radicals, Jake, getting a few extra drivers to that team. But uh, they've got a lot of work to do to climb their way back up into uh, top three teams in the McLaren. Oh, they certainly do. And they'll work very hard on it. They're looking to get a more uh, discerned focus, shall we say, on being that world championship high quality team. And that comes down to getting Infinity Sim Sport and all the drivers out of there involved, getting the high profile names like Ryan Littlemore and Will Tregertha to give themselves that very big opportunity of realism. And that's going to mean that in the long term, drivers like Umashima, Mogar Filio, uh, Yuta Saito, they're all going to improve out of it. That's going to be massive for them when they move forward into 2018. And they just need a couple of tenths of a second and something to really like to stick underneath them as a team. So Rasmussen crosses the line. It'll be 20 laps to go here. He's going to lap Alex Sadler, but he leads this race by half a second. Ahead of Sebastian Job, Sadler out of the way and lets the leaders go through. Riley Preston and Josh Rogers in third and fourth. They're about 12 seconds behind the leading bunch. Oscar in fifth. Lochner in sixth. He's still in DRS range of Tommy Oscar. They've been battling all race those two. Alex Simpson, the veteran, is in P7. David Williams behind in P8. Rounding out the top 10, it's Martin Van Luznord and Diogo Oliveira. Interestingly enough, those drivers from 7th to 10th, all former World Championship drivers. There are how many? Four, five, six. Six former World Championship drivers, Jake, in the top 10 at the moment. There are, and that shows that experience does count for a lot then in this series. But there are some very quick pretenders looking to try and get through. But... Something that I've just been keeping my eye out on, yes, was that Oliveira Van Lusnor battle. And it just seems that it's stalled a bit for Diogo Oliveira. He knows that any mistakes allow Zelensky through, Zoran Jonjic through. But, you know, you get caught behind and you almost get tunnel vision from time to time, Johnny. There's no real chance for moves to be made and for anything to be happening at this stage. And right now, it's about just trying to maintain the status quo, I think, for a couple of drivers at this late stage. Yeah, that's the issue. You don't want to be taking too many risks. Although Rasmussen... You know, what does this matter now for core? You know, whether 
Rasmussen leads or not, is there a huge difference? By the way, we'll talk about that later because something's happened to Josh Rogers. He's lost a lot of time last lap around. He may have actually skipped the final chicane if I'm going to have a guess. That's a very wrong guess. Something's happened to Josh Rogers and he's lost a few There's seconds. Heavy damage on the front wing again. So I'm going to have a look at that one for you, Johnny. And it looks like it's happened through turn three and turn four four out on circuit so having a look at it heads through four gets a little bit aggressive with the wall heading through four and nothing really else that's happened to him on that lap so maybe just clipping the wall at turn number four is just done enough to really unsettle that vehicle so let's keep track of his lap times for josh rogers because that could really hamper his race right now 16, mid 16s is about where the leaders are lapping right now. Anybody behind about 16.7, 16.8. Let's have a look at Sebastian Job. Very close to Erasmus. And he almost got him, I think, there, Jake, but not close behind. I think the main thing here is let's have a look at Josh Rogers' lap time because he may lose a potential fourth place result. That's going to be questionable because it's seven seconds back to Tommy Ostergaard, who's now making the charge to the line. And, well, that gap stands at probably six seconds right now as things stand. So six seconds, enough to really start worrying Josh Rogers in the late stages here with the battle that's going on. Still, though, Rasmussen versus Job. Still, though, Job playing the waiting game. I, I'm wondering if he's leaving it too late and he doesn't have the tire life to make anything important or special happen out of this. Little wide line, though, from Rasmussen. Struggling a little bit to get the power down. This is Job's chance, surely. And don't forget, Sebastian Job did pit a lap earlier than teammate Freddie Rasmussen. Here they are on the main straight, up to 336 kilometers an hour for Seb. Bouncing over the curbs, up close to the wall of champions. They'll begin another lap. Does Seb have a shot here into turn one? Let's have a look. Not close enough. He thought about it, Johnny. He did think about it. But I think at this stage, it's got to be a Hail Mary move that you'd have to feel from Sebastian Job. And it's your teammate. If it goes wrong, there will be a lot of mincing of words between the pair of them. And both of them really want to make sure that they're at the top. I think the team will step in and say, you know, you can't do anything that is massive in terms of an untowards but there's still that battle going on with Van Luzen and Oliveira and Oliveira around contact with Zelensky and he's up on Zelensky's front nose oh goodness Oliveira's got terminal suspension damage I think yep he oh. does that's race over for Diogo Oliveira I think that's going to be very difficult to, to maneuver I don't know how he's keeping that car in a straight line but he's being swamped by the field behind and that's not good for his charge at a top 10 finish in this championship. Don't forget the top 10, get a world championship license for the 2018 iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series. If you've just joined us, have a look at the lead here. Sebastian Job around the outside of Freddie Rasmussen. They've been scrapping all race. Freddie's led every single lap, but this is the closest we've seen Sebastian Job all race. Is he about to crack the code? Oh, well, that's gonna be a question if he can crack it or if he can't, and I think it's going to be very close if he has. not close enough through turn three and they have to form up through the middle section so Seb had a good look there at Freddie and this could go down to the wire now I know we have seen Jake in the past Kazuki Umashima in this situation with Gregor Hutu could see another round here at Montreal where it's so difficult to overtake but you crack the driver in front mentally you crack him in terms of saving that tyre life. It's all going to come I tell you what, Johnny, I want to just think about this. I'm going to jump in for a second. Compare this Sebastian Job to the Sebastian of a couple of years ago. Sebastian of a couple of years ago would have gone for that move, would have tried to make it work on the outside, and those two drivers could well have been in the wall. What we've seen here from Sebastian all day long has been what I call heads-up driving. He knows there's a bigger thing at play here than just winning the motor race. He's putting the pressure on Freddie Rasmussen just as if he's entitled to do so, but he's not going to make a move unless he clearly has a nose alongside, which he almost did there, into one. I think he could add a shot there into one, but he's uh, much more rational, like you say, Will. And he did actually crash here a couple of seasons ago. 
Um, I don't know if you remember that race well. That might have been 2015. But, yeah, he has qualified well here in the past. It was one of the first races we said, oh, look, Sebastian Job, very quick, young, cool. And yeah, he ended he up uh, butchering the event. He then Silverstone, didn't he? Yeah. But now he's changed. He's, he's a, got a new team, new atmosphere. He's moved out of home. And who knows what's going to happen at court. Um, quite feisty, feisty bunch of drivers in the end right now. Let's have a look at Josh Thompson in P number nine. He's actually out of the event, Josh Thompson. So the Radicals online driver, issues for him. He's just pulled off to the side of the racetrack, Will. Yeah, that's a shame. That's a shame. What I think we've seen here, it's been a race of attrition, Johnny. And I want to go back really to the first lap of this event when we saw so many drivers get themselves damaged. And I think that, that big crash we had really did change the race for a lot of people and forced them to kind of adapt to the setups which they had in front of them. Uh, I mean, we'll go back and have a look at the start after the race, but the way I saw it, it was close to about 20 drivers involved in that incident down at turn number one and two. People like Tommy Oscar and Maritz Lona, I think they were struggling for that first section as a consequence of that all the way back through the Spolster train that we were talking about. Actually, Spolstra is now down into P number 15, so he really has struggled already. He has. He did repair the front wing damage, so I'm not sure why he's maintained or still struggled more after that. I thought that would have compromised a bit of his poor start, but anyway, he's still getting some solid points. He's ahead of uh, Alex Adler there, Diogo Oliveira ahead of him. Zelensky's had a good event. Like what I've seen from Massimiliano Ficarra. I think Michael Partington, he's had better races and better days. He's in P12. Uh, P11, excuse me. Jonjic after that spin as well, Will. I think he's recovered to a top 10 result here, but it's it's really been a lot of gifts from other drivers spinning out too. Yeah, I think you're completely right. A lot of drivers here, I think, are thanking their lucky stars here today that they were able to salvage something out of this event. We, we always say that Montreal can be a bit of a wild card round and it really was me here today i'm keeping half an eye out by the way on alex simpson because he's been kind of chipping away at that gap over maritz Lona, um as well as tommy osgard over the last kind of 10 or so laps there are only going to be 12 to go at the line and i think alex simpson might just have enough to get into at least the rs range we know traditionally how fast an apex car can be once he gets into that DRS range, but of course, you've got Lona and Oscar just ahead of them. And I don't think this battle's over either. I think Lona's going to try and find a way of getting P5 out of this event. Yeah, he will. And the more they scrap, the more that's going to reel in Alex Simpson, as he said. So he's got a shot here. I think David Williams is seven seconds behind. That's just too far behind. He's currently lapping around the same lap times as this bunch. So Williams looks set for P8. Van Luznord's 24 seconds behind. <laughs> David Williams, it's almost a pit stop advantage that David has. So he's more than comfortable there in P8. Van Luznord ninth. Jonjic though, and Michael Partington putting the pressure on for that ninth position on Martin Van Luznord. Uh, Josh Rogers and Preston, they've had a quiet race too, Will. The two Aussies back in third and fourth. They've, um, you know, at the start, I thought maybe they were keeping the core sim racing duo honest, but the, the core sim racing teammates have pushed each other out in front by more and more. Let's go back, though, to what Jake was saying earlier on at the top of this broadcast. He released the racing team. They just want to make sure they get drivers qualifying. Third place for Riley Preston, that is exactly what they need to do. And I think Joshua Rogers has subscribed to that mentality as well. He knows that he might not have the pace to go for victory here today. But what he is thinking is, wait a minute, I get P4 every single race. There's no way that I'm not going to punch my ticket into the 2018 World Championship Grand Prix Series. So actually, you can almost go back there, Johnny, and think that that's a kind of thing that it's the smart mentality. Winning races, as Jake said earlier, isn't necessarily the way to win Oops, the Saddler's around. Yep, so that's true. You've got to be consistent, as uh, Alex Sadler's had some issues. He's around, and that is at turn number seven. He's touched the wall there on the exit. He spun around, Jake, and there's a lot of front wing damage to go with it. Yeah, there is, and Alex Sadler was lucky that he didn't collect anybody else in that incident as well, so holds himself in good stead, the Radicals driver, and keeps himself going, but not a mistake you want to be making with 11 laps to go in this event, and well, it's a showdown, 
between the leading two. It's a showdown between those in P5, 6 and 7. Look how close Alex Simpson is now. Just got Victor Prato in between him and Moritz Lochner. And it's also a showdown for the final spots inside the top 10. Van Lusnel versus Jonjic still heating up. Yep, exactly. And Will talked about this long season. The calendar, we were in, at Interlagos last round for the first of 10 rounds in the championship. Montreal here for round number two. We head to Silverstone next weekend. And then Suzuka and Circuit of the Americas before there's a one-week break for the new build and update. And we head to Monza for one event before our two-week holiday, holiday break over the Christmas period. And we return in the new year for Spa, Imola, Indianapolis, and the Nürburgring to end the season. Um, I think you know, we've finished this Pro Series at the Nürburgring for a few years already. Brilliant racetrack to finish at. It's always producing some entertainment there. That will be for 60 laps of action. All coverage for every single round this season will be on Racepot TV and iRacing Live. So um, for more information, visit the Racepot.tv website and iRacing.com forward slash live. Don't forget, you can also get our Black Friday membership renewals discounts, if you want to call them. One year renewal, only 82.50, regular price of 110. Two year renewal, 149.25. You save 50 bucks on that one. So uh, renew for as much as you can. And you could potentially race in the World Championship. Who knows? If you are good enough in the future, you can uh, really enter the Pro Series and prove your worth against this top talent. The funny thing is, Jake, some of these guys who are finishing last year today, you go to your average, you know, YMCA race or whatever, these guys would be um, <laughs> top, of the, top of the tables there in your, in your amateur leagues. These guys are very quick. These guys are fantastic and the best of the bunch. And... You'd like all of them in your team if you really could. I mean, Evolution Racer team are trying to get all of them in their team, but that's another story. But you look at all the talent that's available and everyone is pushing. Everyone's trying everything to make the moves. And again, Job incredibly close to Rasmussen, the closest he's ever been so far. DRS will be opened in activation with 10 laps to go. Nine when he crosses the line. He'll move to the inside. No, he'll have to dupe it back to the outside here because Rasmussen is not letting him have anything. Yep through that corner. He had a bit of a twitch there. He touched the grass in the braking zone and that's cost Sebastian Job a few tenths here. So critical time for the young man from the UK. He can't find his way through Freddie. And they go through the first couple of corners. Spolster's the more out. and more traction they gain, the better his bolster is out of this event, Jake. Oh, wow. He's it's been technical. all over the place today. It's technical, which is the worst type of out that you could be. And Boris Spolster will be incredibly upset with that because he he's had a good race though today he he did scrap out with everyone and prove to everyone how good he could be but it's going to be the case Boris Spolster is going to be out due to sub, uh, substantial circumstances out of his control Simpson's also lost seven tenths of a second over the last so, few laps there. Alex Simpson's lost a yeah he's lost a lot of ten, a lot of time here uh, he's 2.4 seconds back on Moritz Lochner so uh, well, he looks all set for P7, Alex Simpson. He needs the points. That's, uh, he finished uh, quite highly as well in race number one. And Tommy Oscar, where is he? Eight seconds behind. He looks comfortable and set for P5 because uh, he's got some lap cars. Was there a spinner there, Jake? I'm not sure if you saw a spinner there on the exit of turn number nine. I didn't quite know. So I, I wonder if he you found Sandra. that. Oh, so that would probably... Manuel Domingo. It was Manu Manuel Domingo. Sorry to cut you off there. That's fine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. I didn't see it. You've got more info than I have. Yep, so Manuel Domingo. He's out of the event too. He's pulled off the side of the racetrack. Uh, Sebastian Job, though. Creeping in closer and closer. Come on, Seb. Throw it up the inside somewhere. Just have a go. But there's always impartiality there, Johnny, and you're starting to fringe it on the edge of it, but... Right now, you'd say, even if he doesn't make the move, Frederick Rasmussen is having the drive of his life on this defense. And it goes to prove to you, Rasmussen can be a jack of all trades and is arguably the next poster boy of sim racing. Uh, possibly. Who knows what Seb's true pace could have been, though, if he was out in front. 16.5s, not bad lap times for this course sim racing duo. We know... Canada does take its toll on those rear tyres, so just the stop-start nature of the circuit, lap cars as well, 
always making things very interesting through the final chicane and there'll be seven laps remaining as they cross the line so you know, jake i'm not sure you know about you but the best overtaking spots on the circuit turn number one which we just went through you have the hairpin at turn 10 but that final chicane as well you've got drs to aid them through the final chicane and through turn number one but this hasn't worked out for sebastian job and he's not even in a drs or ers train no, he isn't, and that's the big difficulty. He's been struggling with that dirty air effect. Something else I've noticed, though, Johnny, Zoran Jondrich has lost the position to Partington, so Partington now has the final spot in the top 10. Yeah, redemption for Michael Partington. And he's got eight tenths to make up. And Martin Van Luznord in front. Van Luznord is a very speedy sim racer. And that's his teammate, too. The two ERT cars, ninth and 10th. We've got a Kawanda in P8. Apex Racing UK 7th, Core Motorsports in 6th, Tommy Osgard for PSR, good to see a PSR car in the top 5 by the way, DTL 4th, ERT again in 3rd, and then Core Sim Racing, not Core Motorsports, they're in 1st and 2nd, and that orange, white and black livery, and Rasmussen got very close to the wall there again at the final chicane. He did, and now Sebastian Joe within three tenths of a second, and again the visible reminder in the mirrors of the pressure being applied right now between Job and Rasmussen. Rasmussen on very stringent defense, Job on very stringent offense. It seems at this stage, Zelensky in front of them, Fakara in front of them, the Jondrić Partington battle in front of them. I don't think they'll reach by the end, but still those little bits of traffic. That's the sort of marker post that Job wants to be hit wants to have the opportunity to get through and make those moves and arguably should be trying at least to have a go at this one today. Yeah, he should. Zelensky's in P13, so at the moment, at this pace, they could lap everybody except for possibly P8 up. Who knows? Um, at the moment, this pace is insanely quick. They're about a second quicker than those guys. So, yeah, actually, calculation's correct, Jake. They'll even lap Martin Van Luznord. So, only your top eight looks like they'll finish on the lead lap. But more importantly, Sebastian Job still has a shot at the lead. And the more they scrap away, the slower they'll become. Yes, and that's going to be very crucial as well. They've got the gap now to be able to fight amongst themselves. It's not a case of losing time. It's a case of making moves. Five laps to go. Five more opportunities then for the driver of Sebastian Job. And only five opportunities down into that final chicane. He's got to go and do something. Is he waiting for the last lap or is he hoping to maybe get it beforehand and then defend from the front and run away? Well, I mean, he's been trying all race if he saves it for the final lap it'll be heroic more than heroic we'll have to write a comic book series on this race because it'll be a superhero for that one it looked like he's been trying all race Zelensky out of the way and makes it easy for him so Zelensky I mean kids that's how you get out of the way if you're a lap driver and uh, he's right behind now Zelensky's in a battle as well for P13 with Diogo Oliveira so he has to also look out and Jon uh, Jonic in front. Very close here to Michael Partington for P10. He is very close, but look at this. He doesn't have any DRS in comparison. Partington was behind that at the line. So Partington had a shocking run out of that hairpin, but gets the good chance and gets himself to go away. And Job again onto the rear of the driver of Rasmussen. Now four to go. And Rasmussen knows again that he's got to play ultimate defense. And Job is just stalking his prey, hoping that there is going to be a faltering, a chink in the proverbial armor. This has become a historic race in the iRacing Road Pro Series history. We've had many close battles in the past. But having teammates battle away. Whoa, job almost. What? Oh, man. That's it. I'm out of here. This is just too intense. Sebastian Job almost lost it at turn three. That's the second time that's happened to him this race. And he's lost more and more time to Ra Freddy Rasmussen. More importantly, Jake's still in DRS range. That's the crucial fact, though. He will have another opportunity to close that down. But now the chance is more limited as Job starting to get a little bit wiggly, a little bit too aggressive now with the vehicle. He's got to calm down. Maybe the inexperience, well, the youth, shall we say, the inexperience of controlling the emotions coming into play for Sebastian Job. And that's what he's got to be the most careful thing about with three to go over the line.
Got the RS still. So very quick, 335 on the straight. It might actually help him there. He's not all the way up close to Rasmussen where his viewing of every apex of each corner is blocked. Although now he's caught him at a section of the circuit where he just can't get a move done here. Through turn number one and two. Pass Vidal's center. Into three and four. Oh, so close to the curves. They're really pushing here, Jake. They are. And this is just the level that they have to be at and they have to keep working at because they know if they want to be the likes of Cronkays and Hutus and Houses and Backhams and Shothorsts, they've got to be at that level. They've got to be attacking themselves at this level. And if it's even between the pair of them right now, there is a psychological advantage that Job took out of round one that Rasmussen wants to take out of round two. And they're scrapping just in front of them as well. The battle going on between Partington and Van Luznord as Partington is the closest he's ever been as he looks now for position number nine on his teammate moves to the outside looks to take the position does take the position down onto the brakes in comparison Job not close two to go oh and Van Luznod almost lost it he keeps it together though and he's under attack from Zoran Jonjic he's gonna find a way through is he nope he can't so Van Luznod Sustains P number 10 and a top 10 result at the moment. Oh, Jobby! Jobby and Rasmussen have collided. That's at the hairpin, I believe. And it looks like Rasmussen's actually hit the incident limit too, possibly, Jake. He's out of the event from that incident there. Oh, my goodness. So with two laps remaining here, drivers in a, oh, in a whole heap of scrap. They are in a whole heap of scrap here. It's Nicholas Rasmussen, not Frederick there, going out the gap. SRT driver and everything just points and proves that there is still chances. There's still availability. And the issue for the final lap for Rasmussen is there's a Jonjic, there's a Van Luznord. They are just in front and will have to be negotiated, you feel, as Partington makes a mockery of that final, oh, that final hairpin. But look at this. Sebastian Joe tucked him right underneath with an opportunity the white flag coming out this time by and Job very much within range here closes three tenths two tenths one tenth move defensively from Frederick Rasmussen not happening here they go through the final chicane they'll cross the line the white flag will wave and this could be Sebastian Job's final shot at the lead he Rasmussen's led every lap of the event here he goes around the outside Sebastian Job for the lead oh they're still alongside it's each up. other and they collide Rasmussen's dropped down to P2 and Seb waits oh a bit of sportsmanship between the two Seb lets him through how about that for a final lap of the event well fair play to Sebastian Job there he had the opportunity to leave that one run for the hills but that is very good sportsmanship there from Sebastian Job and I have to take my hat off and applaud to that because he wants to do it properly he doesn't want to have the race end in such a dilapidating fashion as that, Johnny. Well, this race is not over yet. Let's see what happens here because we know that there's no team orders. We know that Seb will go for the lead if he has the shot. Will he do it here on the final lap? His only shot is into that final chicane. The checkered flag being ready to wave. That could have been a lot more interesting because they look at the mad scrambling lap cars ahead. That's Zoran Jonjic, Martin Van Luznord. They were scheduled to catch them. Not anymore. It looks like Rasmussen here could possibly claim the victory. Final chicane, one last time. Rasmussen has led every single lap of this event. He started on the front row and he wins round number two of the iRacing Road Pro Series. Brilliant victory, the first of the season for him. And what a collision it was on the final lap. Sebastian Job comes home second with a bit of sportsmanship. And it's another course sim racing front row. What about Riley Preston though in P3 for ERT? He rounds out the podium ahead of Josh Rogers, his Australian compatriot. Tommy Oscar will just finish ahead. Of Core cool, Motorsports, Moritz Lochner there in the end for fifth and sixth. What an event it was, Jake. That battle for the lead. By the way, Diogo Oliveira on the final lap of the event, he's out. 
Oh, my goodness. So, Diego Oliveira out on the final lap. That's going to be crucial. Still a battle, though. John Jic versus Van Luzel. And John Jic tries to send one down at the hairpin. That's not going to work. Maybe there's going to be a little bit of help from the ERT machine just in front of Partington. Not quite too sure about that. But John Jic, here's the chance, the final chance. Yeah, here they go. So, actually, Oliveira actually completed the race. So, we had a glitch on the timing screen. But... He's currently finished 15th. Let's have a look at Yonjic. He's too far behind. Yonjic has had an eventful event. Bit of an alliteration there. Maybe not. Nope. Can't make his way past. So Martin Van Lusenord into the top 10. Michael Partington. Good end to the event. He had an abysmal start. But finished off strong. That's very important. He comes home in ninth. I have to say though. For Rasmussen and Job. Jake. Bit of sportsmanship. What would you have liked to see? I think everyone likes sportsmanship and I think everyone likes seeing just how respectful Sebastian Job was to his teammate in that situation. He could have very easily decided to be selfish and that's what you're taught as a driver. You've got to be selfish. You want to win. You want to be the one driver at the top. But Sebastian Job thought more about that. He wanted to win the right way, the fair way. And I think that Although it's maybe a little bit of a cop-out sometimes for fans. After seeing an incident like that, they want to talk about controversy. Instead of talking about controversy, they now talk about the good fair play nature that there was between Job and Rasmussen. And I think that is fantastic to see out of Sebastian and Job. And that's my hat off Doft. And Riley Preston rounding out the podium. He had a quiet race, but both he and Josh Rogers, brilliant event. And that's what they need to make it into the World Championship. Two young men here, two young prospects. Yeah, two young prospects as things stands. And, well, Riley Preston doing a good job. Josh Rogers into position number four as well, making sure that everything worked in his favour, just calmly scoring a fourth place after starting position four on the grid. But that was a race that I don't think many people predicted at the very start of this race, especially with the lap one incident, especially with the amount of gains that were done all throughout the field. So as the drivers enter the pit lane here on the in-lap, let's take a look at the final race results for round number two of the iRacing Road Pro Series. So Freddy Rasmussen, victorious after an hour and a half of racing, just ahead of Sebastian Jobby's teammate. The two collided on the final lap, but a bit of sportsmanship from Seb allowed Freddy back through. He led every single lap of this event on his way to the first victory of the season. They were followed by Riley Preston and Josh Rogers in third and fourth. Tommy Oscar's strong event there in the positive sim racing car. He finishes fifth, followed by Moritz Lochner, who kept him honest. Alex Simpson and David Williams, two very well-known names in the sim racing community, come home in seventh and eighth. Rounding out the top 10 was Michael Partington and Martin Van Luzenord. Zoran Jonjic was the last driver to finish on the lead lap, just ahead of the leaders. And it was Ficara. Zelensky had a strong event too. Diogo Oliveira was all over the place. Started 10th, finished in 14th. Richard Arno, though, solid event. Came home in 15th after starting outside the top 10. He, the same for Giuseppe Ragusa and Fabrizio Jobby. What about Enric Andre? Started in 30th, came home in 18th. And uh, more names down the order. Rasmussen, unfortunately, towards the end of the event had... Uh, we had a disqualification almost, so he was out of the event due to the incident limit. Spolstra, Domingo did not finish the event. Lots of DNFs this race, all the way down from P24 to 37. We know what happened with Michael Dinkle in the opening laps of the event. Started in third. Brilliant start. Collected behind note by a couple of drivers. So we'll take a short break here and we'll bring you post-race coverage of the second round for the iRacing Road Pro Series. What an event it was there. It went down to the wire between the two core sim racing teammates. Reminds you of the Mercedes battles they had in 2014 between Hamilton and Rosberg. We have it here again. It's Rasmussen and Job for the 2017 to 18 Pro Series. Don't leave us. We'll talk to you after the break.
What a race we just had for the second round of the R Racing Road Pro Series from Circuit Shield Villeneuve, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. And it had everything from the first corner right until the final lap. Let's start by showing you what happened again on that first lap of the motor race. And the first thing we've got to pay attention to was the fact that Michael Dinkle had a fantastic start to the event. And then it all went wrong for him there, Johnny, down on that first corner. Yeah, he got collected behind by, um, I think that was Josh Rogers. And so just unfortunate for Michael Dinkle, who is a very consistent driver, very respectful out there. He doesn't like to get into too much trouble, but I don't think he'll blame Josh Rogers too much for that. Um, but it was a bit of a, yeah, definitely a race ender for Dinkle. And you know what? He'll bounce back from it. There's plenty of rounds to go. We have eight more races after this. Yeah, I just saw Owen Talman then actually hitting Istvan Bala before they even got to the first corner. And you know what? That scene we saw on the first corner, on board of Talman still, that looks a bit like the big one at Talladega there, Jay. It does. And I, I'd say in Formula One terms, the entire first lap was the big one. And it comes down to many drivers being caught out. Ricardo Orozco, I think, was caught out in the instant into the wall. I think we saw 7-8. I think we even saw a vehicle go off at turn one itself in the form of Michael Partington, I do believe it was, in the opening stages. So everyone getting caught up in that opening incident, leaving the top four or five to break away. But my goodness, did it set up some brilliant battles up and down the field for the majority of the mid part of the race. Yeah, there's a look at Partington. We'll see if we can get this one properly from him. There we are from the start. In towards turn number one. Yeah, he just gets hit side on. And to have that, and what we saw really, Johnny, throughout this event was more than anything else, it's ironic to say it, pure driving skill, because a lot of these drivers had damaged cars, but it became about how you can manage a race car when it's not in tip-top condition. Yeah, a lot of drivers had damage today, and we, we reflected in those very long pit stops too. It came in, it looked like we had more long pit stops than quick pit stops today, and it wasn't anything to do with, um, you know, with hitting your marks wrong or something like that. It was just pure damage to the cars. It's what affected Boris Spolstra through that first stint, and that's what cost the likes of Tommy Oscar had a lot of lap time. I think Tommy could have really been up there and, and challenged Rally Preston and Josh Rogers for P3 and 4, possibly, if he wasn't held up in the first stint. Well, I want to have a look at the replay on board with Sebastian Joe, because we haven't actually talked about this one. Here we are. Just bogs down at the start there. Freddy Rasmussen right past him immediately as a consequence of that. I want to get a replay on board of Freddy Rasmussen as well, because Rasmussen had such a fantastic start to this event. We barely talked about it because of all the carnage behind him, Johnny. Yeah, exactly. So, um, look, we'll speak... <laughs> Moral of the story is we'll speak to Seb and, and Riley in a second, Sebastian Job, Riley Preston, because um, they are our interviews for today. And I think um, I think those two have a lot of words to say there. They were in different uh, battles, but the field behind, though, that's why we had drivers of uh, Oscar and Lochner from outside the top 10 also making their way through through all that carnage. Yeah, indeed. So, in fact, we're going to hand it over to you, Johnny, because you are stood by with that driver of Sebastian Job coming home in P number two here today. Thanks, Will. Sebastian, interviewed you last time in Interlagos. You're here again. You just, I mean, can't seem to leave me. P2, how about, talk about the final lap, first of all, because you waited all race. You finally had a good move around the outside and then just a bit of sportsmanship, it seemed. Yeah, uh, I kind of knew Freddy was, uh, well, I wasn't sure if Freddy would leave room on the outside, but I decided just to, uh, go for it and if we had contact on the last lap then I'd let him pass because in previous laps I wasn't really sure um, if he was like because I saw he was using all the track on exit of turn one but I wasn't sure if that was as in he had no more grip or he was just doing it to defend for turn two so I just had to like it was a bit of a gamble and then we had contact because I overshot so I, I couldn't take a position like that and had to let him through um, yeah I, I don't think it's like great sportsmanship I think it'd be awful if you just didn't let them back through. Yeah, After true. That. At the same, at the same time, though, I mean, you started from pole position. You should have had the lead for most of this race, but again, you just couldn't figure out the the start off the line. You you said last round that that was a weakness of yours, and it seems again it's it's caught yeah. you unaware because yeah, next be season like in the forever, world championship. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially in the world championship next year, that's going to be even worse. Yeah, um, like I don't know. Maybe I can like. 
get an expensive wheel in the future and get a hand clutch because my feet aren't good enough for it. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, it will be a problem for at least the entire Pro Series, I imagine. So I just have to keep hoping I, I don't fall back further than third for the first lap because maybe like between the Pro Series, if I qualify um, between the Pro Series and WCS, I can work on it. But at the moment, it's not really. I don't know how to fix it. And did you think that you were faster than Freddie today, but you were just stuck behind him for most of the race because uh, maybe your race pace would have been quicker, but there was just no way through. Um, uh, in the first stint, Freddie was quicker for sure. Like, um, I was having to push quite hard to keep up. Apart from the first few laps when I had the RS, it was fairly comfortable, but then I made a mistake. And yeah, we, we were quite similar pace, but I think I was pushing quite a lot, and that's why I had the um, two, like min or two or three mini moments that I had. Um, but then second stint, I, was, I felt way more confident with the car, so I think I was a bit quicker there, but made for a good battle, so it's, it was good. There you go, Will. Sebastian Job, not a winner this time out, but still in P2, and that's brilliant to make his way into the top 10 by championship's end, and that will give him a world championship license for next year too. Yep, and he's looking to still carry on doing that. Again, we're only two rounds in into the series, but course in racing as a whole look strong we're still going to talk about the dominance of the big teams in this series in a couple of moments time but first going to hand it over to jake sperry he stood by with the driver of riley preston who rounded out our podium here today yes mr riley preston formerly part of the orion setup but the loan has ended now with evolution racing team and as a team looking to try and develop and try and put in some really good finishes and results, P3, a quiet race overall, you've got to be pretty happy with that, surely. Hey, how you going, guys? Uh, yeah, really pleased with the result today, and everyone in the team's been working super hard. Uh, a little bit disappointed not to be a bit closer to the core car, Sebastian and Frederick. They're just insanely quick later in the stint, and I think I can't speak for my other team members, but... Uh, seems like we were suffering from the same tyre issues we had at Interlagos, which is a bit unfortunate, but, you know, I think third was definitely the best result I could have gotten today. Well, it is a very good result for you, but let's talk us through the opening sections of your of your race, because you were there, you were within that one-second window, you were trying to hold yourself to Rasmussen and Job, and then it, it seems that the tyre issues do become an issue, so is that something that the team is desperately trying to look into try and basically just hit every setting possible to try and fix in this machine yeah yeah for sure pretty much exactly what we're doing you know uh and as for the start of the race you know uh, i was holding on pretty nicely in the first sort of five laps but then as you saw i just dropped off and couldn't keep up and at that point i was more concerned with rogers behind me well, you certainly do have to be concerned with the drives behind you, but it moves you up uh, in essence, shall we say, because we don't have official standings of the points as things stand, in towards third in the championship, which arguably in terms of safety and security is the best place that you can possibly be at this stage behind the two core cars. So is it a case of, you know, top 10's the goal first and foremost and then looking to challenge for wins? Or is it a case of maybe having a win or two through this season would be the most desirable effect for your team? Uh, well, if you ask my team boss, Brenton O'Brien, it's all about the top tens and just getting that license for next year. But <laughs> in my opinion, it's more about getting the good results, getting some wins throughout the season and finishing well in the championship. So, you know, I'll be I'll be pushing as hard as I can to get some more pace and try and compete with the core guys. Well, the moniker of the unluckiest man in sim racing starts to fade away from you at the end of 2017. But before we let you go, any shout outs or sponsors? Uh, yeah, big thanks to Logitech G for sponsoring us. I did this race with my trusty Logitech G29, so good stuff there. And thanks to the rest of the team for helping out with all the setups and everything. No worries. And thanks, Riley thanks Preston. Brenton oh, as yeah. well for spotting me. Of course, you've got to thank Brenton O'Brien. Brenton O'Brien with the thanks. <laughs> Riley Preston there uh, in position number three overall for that one there, Will. And you have to say after this event, I think there's going to be a lot of drivers frustrated that they didn't capitalize on an opportunity here today. And Silverstone is a circuit which is very different to the likes of, say, what Montreal is. That's going to be a completely different challenge. And not having momentum into Silverstone is arguably going to be the biggest challenge all season. I'll tell you one thing. I have not been able to find 
my race bot notebook ever since I went away to Liverpool a couple of days ago. So I've been writing notes down the back of business cards and all things. And the one thing that stood out for me on that interview right there, Jake, is ERT talking about tyre issues. The same situation that when radicals started hitting their prime, they had tyre issues. They, they would fall off after about 10 laps or so. Same with Apex Racing UK. When they started hitting their prime, they would fall off after about 10 laps or so. I've got a theme, though. A team who are finding something that helps them in qualifying, helps them get up the top of the order, but they cannot find a way of translating that information from a qual pace to a race pace. And I think that's the big difference between the Coanders and the Red Lines and everybody else right now is that they find a way to save the tyres and make sure that the tyres work. And it just seems that everybody else is looking for a way to make something work, to make something seem nice and available and working. And, you know, you're starting to look down the points, which is just updated. And you look at drivers like Diego Oliveira, who's had two very consistent runs in position number 11 you look at someone like say alex simpson who you know is starting to get over that edge is starting to deal with those issues a lot more he's in position number five very similar in terms of paces from time to time but the big difference is the tire wear is the fact that it's not going away on certain vehicles compared to others and that's the big issue that a lot of drivers are looking at and trying to work out and it seems that there's only a very select few who know the actual answers. And the thing is, Johnny, we can go back to the day that we had our first ever race in the World Championship Grand Prix Series in this car. And the issues, they started with Coanda. They were the team that could not find a way of making those tyres work. And you know what? I'm going to put it out there. It's one of the contributing factors from Hugo Luis retiring from the Grand Prix Series. Yeah, exactly. Um, one thing I just want to bring up is now I know this is a bit off topic but I've been wanting to say it for a few minutes these guys at the top Rasmussen Job 1 and 2 where are they actually going to rank in comparison to all those drivers in 2018 because the race pace right now it was essentially very very quick I think this pro series group is very strong but I just want to know where are they actually going to, to file in into that top five, top ten positions? That's what you look for in the Pro Series. That's what you look for in the past. In the past, you've had Pro Series drivers come home in, in first and second um, in, in the championship, and they may only be a top ten driver at best in the World Championship. I think this year we found some good gems in Rasmus and Job, but where are they actually going to compete in terms of uh, Kronke and Hutu next year? That's, that's what I wanted to really discuss before we left. Well, I, will, I know the answer to that. Go on. And it comes down to yesterday's running and having Peter Berryman there, who you could argue is top five runner consistently in the Irish World Championship when he turns up in quotations. And he only managed on exactly the same qualifying conditions, a 13-7 qualifying time in comparison to the 13-3 that Job did, the 13-4 that Rasmussen did. I think they're up there challenging this season. I really think they do for 2018. But you've got to remember at the same time, you know, Peter Barrowman, he's running for fun more than anything else right now. These guys are putting basically 14 weeks of their lives into qualifying for our championship season. I don't think that's a perfect barometer. I would say, you know, yes, we've still got the Coanda versus Redline battle, but actually I, I've been out there and said it before. I think Team Redline have fallen apart a little bit over the last couple of years. Not just because of the fact that Hutu has won the World Championship two times in a row, but that team doesn't seem to have the full strengths and numbers it used to. I would say that getting a top 10 in the World Championship Grand Prix Series event anyway is always good. I would say that the way that Core are looking right now, I would not be surprised to see them score top five in the first race of the season. And I would not be surprised to see Core getting a podium in the first three rounds of next season as well. And don't forget as well, what we often see, Jake, is in the first couple of rounds of the um, World Championship Series, the teams that progress from pro over to the World Championship Series, they've come in with a head of steam and they will always start well. I want to think more about where they're going to be in round number 10. But then I look back to see what Core did in terms of the Blancpain GT Series, where they were absolutely dominant.
Yes, and you look for a team to have consistency all throughout the season. There's no point putting all your eggs into a basket early on, putting a lot of effort in, and then not being able to continue that same amount of effort throughout the season. And then you hit burnout, then you hit motivation issues, and then you start not wanting to really race, and you see yourself not qualifying inside the top 20 for the next season. That's the big worry that I think a lot of drivers are going to be having moving on forward into 2018 especially with the talks of maybe implementing a 75 percent races run rule to retain your license as well that's going to be a massive massive issue for a lot of drivers when maybe they don't have the co committance for a full-time schedule if committance is even a word which it probably isn't but the point that i'm getting at is you want to be consistent throughout a season. If you can put that effort in and put it in for every single round of a championship, then by all means, go and do that. But some drivers can't do that. I was talking with David de Corpse. He puts an immense amount of effort in into his world's fastest game of challenge. And he told me straight up, I can't put that same amount of effort into a season-long championship. So I know I'm going to be a little bit slower when it comes to that championship. And that's the big crucial factor. Rachel White, not Rachel Wiley, it's Susie Dent will say, unfortunately, you can't get the points in that word, Jake. Um, however, I want to expand this point a little bit further, Johnny, and I want to use the example of Inex, for example. Inex, they had that season when they won two rounds of the first four, and then they fell back because of the intense team working in the Iris and World Championship Grand Prix Series. When we start considering all this information, we start considering the influx of these top three teams in the Pro Series, Corsin Racing, Evolution Racing Team, Apex Racing UK, are they doing this deliberately to make sure they've got the manpower to take on the top two teams when we get to March 2018? Uh, very long question. Um, I think the manpower is important. I think... Um, oh, well, you've stumped me here a little bit. Look... The more the better is good too. It's a you need a lot of testing. I mean, look at Inex as you said. Like, they've dropped off quite a bit. They've lost Isaac Price, who was really good in terms of the setup side. They'll argue differently. I think that's the truth. Um, he's he's doing a lot there for the core sim racing team. I think just building a team of you need a strong, talented driver to be quick. If that driver is not good with, with setups or anything like that, you need that kind of driver. You need a, a driver that. Um, as long as they're good for team atmosphere, that's important too. You don't want someone who keeps team hopping to six different teams in four years. Um, not having shots in anyone there. I think I know one but, person who you might be thinking about right now. <laughs> yeah. But, but th that's the moral of the story. Is that, to, to team buildings, I could go on all day about. I, I mean, F1 quality is about to go on now. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm getting excited to leave for that. But um, moral of the story is NX... They've dropped off because of the fact that they are losing team members, losing... I'm not sure what's going on behind the scenes, but um, you look at how Apex is starting to build their team. The, the personalities they've got is great there. Coanda doesn't have the biggest team in the world, but they've got all you need. Speed, talent, racecraft, setup builders, uh, atmosphere is great. Um, and they don't have a high volume team, so they, there's... there's plenty of answers to that question i even forgot your question to be honest now like two minutes into my answer so i'm going to pretend i i just answered it that's right can that's i right. just say as well go on I'll, I'll just say as well that apex is probably different to ert and to core in the fact that all the drivers that they're trying to get in were drivers who lost their license in 2017 it's not as if they brought any new names in to get in they're just trying to get the names that were already there to come back in and have another crack at the whip it's very different to, say, trying to put Rasmussen and Job into the championship or trying to make an entire brand new faction of a team get into a championship that they haven't been part of before. Yep. Before we go, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for a new segment here on Racebot TV known simply as You Blew It. Um, first of all, I'm going to start with you, Jake, because you blew it here today because your student union accommodation decided to, well, think you don't have internet for a few minutes. For a few seconds it blew it, yeah. so... And then my account blew it because it decided that I was still in the race, so I blew it. Yeah. Johnny, you blew it here today because you got the two Rasmussen's confused, didn't you? Uh, when, when they crashed. Yeah. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't hear what you were saying. You just said something. Every time you speak, it's like there's a crash happening. So I'm like, oh, my God, I saw Rasmussen like almost hit the wall. And then you say Rasmussen hit the wall. And I'm like, I didn't know the two behind were battling. So I take half the blame for that. 
And I um, blew it because I thought that I was saying instructions to people. And after stepping in for Jake's Berry, I forgot to realize my mic was still loud. <laughs> so I blew it yeah. as well. We all blew it here today, ladies and gentlemen, on Race Spot TV. We like having fun with you guys. That is all we have got time for here today. Boy, However, what? thank you so much for all of you who's been a part of our broadcast. Before we go, these are the people that get it done for us. Of course, on commentary, it's been Jonathan Simone and Jake's Berry. TV cameras done by Isma Balau, track cams with gourmets. Find that facebook.com forward slash track cams. Our overlay design by Andreas Warner and And One Design. Our overlay animation by app engineer.in and live time and scoring brought to you by Nick Fifton. We will see you all in Silverstone in just one week's time. In the meanwhile, from the entire team here on Racebot TV, we will talk to you all next time. Goodbye.